This is the Plug and Play Smart Cities Conference, and I'm here to talk about some groundbreaking research that we endeavored on a couple years ago that look at the impacts to cities on, from digital payments. I'm here at Plug and Play to meet with the ecosystem of smart cities, smart city vendors, companies, all looking towards understanding how the smart city ecosystem is shaping in the future. I came in to speak a little bit more around prototypes for smart cities for the future. I think it's important to have government, corporations, and startups coming together. Smart cities are necessary because our planet's gonna go from seven billion to nine billion people. The existing law enforcement apparatus is just not gonna be able to scale. Something we've seen a little bit, but attending today's session really cemented is the idea that the smart city is not about just dealing with a city. City's a community, and any solution that really goes into a city has to be a community-first solution. I think the biggest thing was how diverse this discourse is, and how many different kinds of players are actually involved in the smart city space. As a startup in the ecosystem, one of the things that's very challenging is getting connected with the right corporates who can help us continue to grow and potentially even fund our growth as well. And Plug and Play has been instrumental at making the connections to the companies that we would like to meet with and would not have otherwise been able to speak with. You have a lot of people with a lot of ideas, but when they're disparate, it doesn't work. They need to come together and they need to come together efficiently and have a transparent forum to work together to hit their objectives. Hello, hello. Welcome back from uh from your lunch break. Welcome to the afternoon session um, of our Winter Summit, Expo Day 3. My name is Jennifer Elfman. I am um, an innovation manager in the IoT vertical, but I'm also heading our Smart Cities initiative here at Plug and Play in Silicon Valley. So we have a tiny piece of content for you um, about Smart Cities this afternoon, and um, that's what we'd like to start with right now. Great. So, we have a little bit reshaped our vision about smart cities. We, we know that the topic of smart cities has been around for a decade now, but we see that it's really being rolled out now, being adopted now, and that's why Plug and Play wants to get engaged in the topic of smart cities again. And um, how, how, what's our vision on it? So we want to be the ultimate innovation platform to develop the smart solutions for the cities of the future, by bringing all the relevant stakeholders together in one collaborative ecosystem. And while we have been extremely strong in the past on the private sector side with um, our corporations, our corporate network, and our startup network, um, as well as venture capital, we are opening up the platform and we are inviting city councils, municipalities, government, as well as universities onto the platform to work with us, to collaborate with us, and make the th cities of the future uh, happen. We have all industries represented at Plug and Play, which is really a great thing about us. And um, we think that the core of smart cities really is to bring together mobility, real estate, energy, and IoT. And how we're going to do that as of next year is um, gonna be presented by our partner, Wade. He's the head of uh, our energy vertical. And I'm li I'd like to invite him on stage to give us a quick introduction of how we're going to synchronize the four programs as of next year. Thanks, you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wade Bitaraf. I'm the uh, founder of Energy and Sustainability at Plug and Play. Uh, started this initiative about three years ago and uh, kind of seeing a number of energy companies shopping for you know, strategic investment in the Bay Area. And today, uh, our energy practice, which is in the fifth cohort, looks at the entire value chain of the energy industry from where the molecules and electrons are produced to the end of the consumers where they generate uh, you know, power in their homes or when they use you know, uh, gasoline in the, in the gas station. So the, our practice today includes a number of electric utilities and oil and gas companies that are seeing their customers' expectation changing and they wanna kind of bring new products and services that can address their needs and interests. So uh, over the past three years, we've seen uh, our utility partners and, and oil and gas partners even spending a good amount of effort in, in investing in, in products and services that aligns with commercial and industrial uh, building facilities as well as uh, homeowners where, where they see they want to know where their 
power is generated and, and they want to reduce their carbon footprint. And they spend a lot of time finding solutions that can build smart facilities and smart homes and can help better uh, create transportation system in the cities and create resiliency and, and safety and, and connectivity in the cities. And, and we realize that by kind of bundling some of the resources that we have been building in the past three years that started in Silicon Valley but is now branched out to China, Europe, and very recently in Houston, where we're going to work closely with the city of Houston, uh, which is the fourth largest city in terms of the number of corporate stakeholders, uh, we realize that we can increase the value proposition for the partners, for the startups, and for ourselves to accelerate the adoption of new technologies and layer in different areas where startups can, can gain more value and validate their solutions much faster and much cheaper. So I'm incredibly excited to be here and announce that on the next year, we're going to align the timeline of our energy and sustainability practice with the three other verticals that we have here in Silicon Valley with uh, real estate and, and construction, Internet of Things and mobility, and call that a broader umbrella of smart cities. And we're going to have our own selection day in the first week of March, and our colleagues can, can share a little bit more on how the selection process would look like and how do we provide this visibility to the other stakeholders, whether you're a construction company, owner, developer, automotive company, into the energy space, and how can you co-develop technologies that can help uh, build a sustainable future for the cities. So thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm excited to be here. We'll be here uh, towards the end of the day uh, in the networking. Feel free to find us and my colleagues in the energy team. Uh, but with that little overview, I'd like to turn it back into Jennifer and invite our uh, panelists uh, come up on stage. Thank you, Wade. <clears throat> Only in the last batch of all these four verticals, we had more than 140 startups engaging in the topics of smart cities. So we really see a lot of traction, and especially in this cross-industry collaboration that we would like to um, facilitate here. As you know, Sa uh, Silicon Valley is not the only location and um, smart cities are spreading into many other locations worldwide. We have established so many smart city hubs already and uh, two of them I invited uh, today on stage because we want to give you a global update of what's happening in the three major regions of the world, EMEA, APEC and the US. And um, that's why we have here today my dear colleagues. So I'd like to invite on stage Sean, who's coming from APEC, he's the VP and Head of Corporate Innovation. Welcome. <laughs> I'd also like to invite Rene and Ben, my dear colleagues from Vienna, who are running the Smart Cities Initiative in Europe. Welcome. <laughs> All right, so we have prepared um, a little panel for you with uh, some of the questions about what's happening in these regions. And um, we'd like to start off with one question, which is um, the different drivers and initiatives actually going on uh, in smart cities around the world. And we had a bit of a discussion yesterday before we go on stage today, and it was very interesting to hear how, how different it is, how, 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 what the different drivers are actually. Maybe I can start off with a, with a quick um, US view on what the different drivers and initiatives are. I think in the US it is really about the, like really getting the tangible impact now of the uh, economic impact that we desire with smart cities. So what we see here is a lot of uh, rolling out and adopting solutions, smart city solutions to reduce costs. And that can be, for example, by automating resources in the cities or by monetizing new data-based business models in the cities um, or um, by even risk and, and damage mitigation that is usually very costly. And with that, we see a lot of public and private partnerships arising. And I'll give you an example, the city of Boston has uh, co-developed um, actually a playbook for smart cities um, together with Verizon. And we think this is these are the partnerships that we see more and more uh, growing together. So, but talking about drivers and initiatives, um, let's hear it from you. What's happening in APEC and EMEA? Well, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so um, glad to be back here in Silicon Valley after about 90% of flying in the air and creating more carbon footprint. <laughs> so I'm hoping to reduce that, obviously, in the coming year. 
But um, basically, Asia Pacific is one of the fastest growing region for us in plug and play, uh, simply by sheer number of uh, you know the population growth. Um, the region represents about 2.3 billion people, and majority of these cities are seeing huge growth and pressure in terms of number of people coming to the cities um, and impacting socioeconomic and even environmentally. So this is really becoming a major um, hurdle for a lot of the government initiatives and private entity to really reduce pressure and create environments, reducing carbon footprint in these cities in major areas like in the countries, especially from Hong Kong and all the way down to Singapore and Indonesia. Thanks, John. Rini, how about Emia? Yeah, so um, what I think what what makes Europe and you know the the whole region kind of differ from APAC is actually that we don't have the pressure that you just spoke of, and it's actually more of a um, a project, a moral obligation, and something that we want to work on um, as a region. And we see a lot of nucleuses popping up. For instance, an uh, interesting project that we have. Uh, is in um, actually an ambitious project and the only one of its kind right now uh, is in Europe. They created a lakeside city and it's basically in the, su the suburb of Vienna where they're popping up a nucleus of a smart city model and the idea behind it is if it's a successful model, this is something they can replicate a, a around Europe because we do see that 75% of Europe's population actually lives within cities, is an urban population and we're gonna see that more increase more and more as time goes on. So so this is a model that they're working on and within the cores of the existing cities that we have, um, they're looking for smart solutions and optimizing what's already existing right there. Um, refi uh, refitting and refurbishing um, buildings, uh, figuring out new solutions for uh, cleaner fuels, et cetera. So these are things that we see um, and that I think makes us quite different because you have that immense pressure and things popping up on a whole on a larger scale, whereas in uh, Europe we see things popping up on a smaller scale. Um, therefore, but the idea is, is that if these are successful models, we can implement them. Yeah, and maybe uh, coming back to the major difference between these two regions, and also I would count the US more on the EMEA side there, is um, I see that a lot of uh, projects in, the, in APEC are actually leapfrogging. So you're not making the same mistakes that we make. <laughs> um, you're, you're going um, straight to the better solution, is that true? Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of infrastructure built in for, you know, for the past 30, 40 years. So everything now has to surpass those you know, putting wire on their grounds and basically everything has to be fast paced and implemented much quicker. Yeah. And Rene, you spoke about these nucleus projects, like forming smaller areas and rolling out solutions there. I know that you're focusing a lot on airports as well. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah, so um, we actually recently hosted an event because, and it was named Aerotropolis, the future of smart cities. And we actually did it within our travel vertical and our travel partners because as we see it right now, um, the smartest cities or models of smart cities that we can find currently in Europe are actually these airport cities. So these airports are actually building little cities around the day-to-day -day business of takeoff and landing. They have businesses there, they have cargo, they have, um, you know, they have their um, uh, import, export, you know, what have you, it's all there. Um, and, you know, they're popping up with kindergartens, with uh, really building up a city around these little airport regions. And they're using smart technology. You know, we're talking about autonomous vehicles on the tarmac, biometric scanning. We're talking about um, efficient buildings that they're building there. So just as an example, uh, Vienna International Airport, where we currently just opened our new office, um, they managed to reduce their carbon footprint by, um, what was it, exactly the percentage? 72%. Yeah, 72%, which is amazing just by, um, you know, adjusting their use and um, investing into smart buildings. And, and that's actually quite amazing. So we're seeing the smart city technology being implemented, already being implemented in airport cities. It's not a well-known thing. Um, but it's definitely exciting as we, ha you know, we have our Travel Europe program and our Smart Cities program, and it actually has very much overlap. Thank you. And speaking of airports, um, I came across a super interesting um, update from the market just recently. 
namely that uh, UPS was just granted um, a, um, just received a government approval, FFA government approval, to operate a, a drone airline. So that's uh, that's quite interesting. I think um, th that means for them they can they can fly as many drones as they want at any time of the day, even during the night, and they are allowed to carry um, cargo um, more uh, like higher than 55 pounds. So. With that license or with that uh, approval, we will see a lot of uh, disruption, I think, coming up now in the airspace uh, <laughs> management as well. And while I was already looking forward to my online fashion shopping being delivered by a drone, um, that's not yet happening. <laughs> um, they are starting to roll this out with um, hospital campuses first. Uh, again, an example of starting small and maybe then uh, expanding later. But maybe you can share some great initiatives that you see right now uh, happening, and I know Ben, you have a great example maybe about that. Yeah, so one thing I am really excited about is um, mobility as a service. So there's, for example, um, this young company called WIM, and what they've developed is a multimodal um, mobility subscription where you basically pay a subscription fee similar to Netflix or other services. Uh, it's a bit more expensive than that. It runs at about 500 bucks in Helsinki, for example. Uh, which is is uh, pretty much the price that you'd pay to um, to own and maintain a vehicle, uh, but it includes all kind of um, um, mobility services, including public transport, but also ride sharing, car sharing, taxis, um, uh, bike sharing services, micro mobility services, uh, even rental cars. Um, and I actually think it's a great way you use this one app. It basically suggests you the fastest and easiest way to get from point A to point B, but also includes parameters like uh, the weather, for example. So this is important in Helsinki. You usually, or uh, maybe you don't want to take a bike all the time, but when it's sunny and traffic is bad, you might prefer uh, taking a bicycle um, instead of taking uh, a Uber. Um, and I think um, this is really something that hopefully will um, uh, will improve in importance. Um, uh, yeah, so this is one project I'm looking forward to. So what's a great initiative in APEC? Oh, there's uh, lots of those. Uh, means there are basically all these smart towns being basically built around smart cities initiatives from smart buildings, connected buildings, to mobility, electrifications of vehicles. But a couple of examples is that I just... Uh, you know, notice that in Singapore, they've already, t Uber's testing out the drone taxi, and they flew it across the bridge, uh, river, I should say, for a small flight to make sure if it lands safely. So that's one example in Singapore, but also in Thailand, they have one transport for all project by government, that basically the rapid railway being in deployed across 500 kilometers of, you know, extended cities. So basically, the you know people can transport much easier, reducing the carbon footprint in a much faster pace. Actually, all the real estate right now being developed in Bangkok is uh, really strategically closer to the uh, skyways, skyway, sky train, I should say, which people can really easily come from home to the sky train and go to the next workplace much faster, rather than traffic. Sounds like a good solution. Maybe we can adopt that in the Bay Area as well. Speaking <laughs> of traffic. Hopefully. Um, so, but uh, t talking of initiatives and especially trends, so what do you see coming? What is the next big thing on smart cities? So, I really feel like in Europe, it's not about big things. It's really about incremental change. I think uh, Rene already mentioned that we don't feel the same pressure as Asia uh, does, for example. And so, for us, it's more about... Um, uh, so. I really don't see that we are at the cutting edge when it comes to technology, but we are really good in um, when we apply the technologies um, that they actually benefit the people. So Vienna, for example, um, I see the move to just two weeks ago is actually considered one of the most livable cities in the world. But when you come to Vienna, it doesn't feel as, as smart as um, Beijing or Hong Kong or Bangkok or Singapore or one of these cities, but apparently um, they are doing something right um, in, in applying the technologies they are using. And I think this is really um, uh, where Europe uh, is doing a great job uh, compared to, to maybe other regions. Well, I say that um, the crown jewel goes to China because the initiative is driven by government and it's mandated that that electrifications of uh, automobiles and, of course, uh, even any mobility devices to be implemented by the next five years in about 30 to 40% of all the vehicles. 
So, but if you look at the rest of the Southeast Asia market, there's a huge amount of pressure because of the traffic congestions and of course all of the uh, roads are being basically being redeveloped and re-geared towards the smart because of the 5G connectivity is being implemented in the major cities. So we're seeing a lot of changes happening and quickly and it's a smart race and smart cities between different countries. In Vietnam, for example, it is really fast-paced development of 5G. I think in the next two years, we're gonna see a huge impact in terms of connectivities. So that's gonna really push the envelopes on a lot of uh, smart solutions yeah. across the cities. Well, that's true. And in contrast to that, um, I had the chance to, to speak to our, our partners, um, Strategy of Things. They help us a lot in our Smart Cities initiative. And they um, made me aware of what's happening in the US as well. And you talked about government. So there's a lot of legislation being uh, released now, especially in the US. So for example, we have the, well, let me read that out. Um, California Consumer Privacy Act that, that will take effect next year that's going to protect your privacy more. And we see a lot of legislation um, now looking into privacy. And I think that's a topic that's becoming more urgent when we talk connected everything I around us, especially when we go into public places. And another thing is uh, we will probably change the narrative a bit about smart cities. So what we see in the US is more we talk smart spaces. So also maybe to make it more digestible because a smart city, that sounds so huge, but when we talk about a smart park or a smart community or a smart building, that, that feels a lot more doable than uh, talking about a big city. And it goes back to the idea of um, upgrading technology in existing places and talking nucleus to, to try things out and then grow them bigger. Yeah, good. Thank you, uh, but I think that the key element in here is execution. And execution is about bringing all the stakeholders to the f kind of a, in a one platform to be able to communicate to understand what the problems are. Um, so what we try to do at Plug and Play is hopefully to bring awareness from the government to the universities, to the corporates, to startups, to make your platform very, very um, active in terms of understanding where the problems are facing in cities and where the solution can be coming from and how quickly this can be tested in terms of a new solutions and implemented. So that is what differentiates one city from the others. I think that's the most important things. That's true, and we as Plug and Play definitely wanna be part of that. That's why we are you know, looking forward to this more intense collaboration across the industries and maybe talking about next year. Let's take a quick look at what's happening next year because we are going to be very active uh, when it comes to smart city events. And uh, maybe, Renee and Ben, would you like to talk about uh, what's happening in Vienna next year? Yeah, so um, we're going to be kicking off on the 20th of February uh, with our Smart Cities program, um, then celebrating our uh, Expo Day in May. And uh, we have a couple of focus areas that we're currently fine-tuning right now. And it's actually quite great because it's not only something that we're doing with our corporate partners, but as you mentioned, where the, the universities are involved, we have the government, the higher officials involved as well, just to also have, we're gonna be hosting a executive round table together with uh, government officials, uh, the Ministry of, um, of Digitalization and Economy, for instance, uh, the newly reelected chancellor as well, just to be talking about what are the issues that Austria currently faces right now, um, and also bring our corporate partners partners to them and th so that they can say, okay, these are things that we can actually solve. And, you know, in plug and play, uh, being the facilitator as per usual, you know, not only are we putting together the meeting, but we can also offer them the technological solutions on the startup side to actually implement these changes. So that's what we're hoping to achieve and, you know, see some uh, real results, uh, even if they're that small, results that we could even present on the 28th of May at our grand opening as well. <laughs> Thank you. So what's happening in Bangkok? Oh, Bangkok is on fire right now. Everything is happening over there. You guys should all come over there to Thailand and see what's going on. So we launched our Smart City program last September, and so uh, we brought in actually uh, 11 um, startup companies from all around the world. Actually, we're connecting the dot from Europe to Silicon Valley down to Asia, meaning that all the corporate partners, they have a visibility that from the different regions and different continents, in terms of all the changes that's happening in a smart city and energy efficiency sides, from the real estate side, from even in health and digital health connected side. So next year we're planning to really do a full-fledged program in terms of uh, bringing a lot more programs in terms of innovation days in each one of those pillars. 
as well as um, full-fledged selections and, of course, engagement of the corporates and the government into this program. So I foresee about maybe multitude of uh, international companies being involved in Southeast Asia as we spearhead the in innovation in the smart cities across. And since we have a visibility across Southeast Asia and, of course, very much cross-border from China and Japan as well into the region. Thank you. So what's happening in Silicon Valley? Of course, we will continue to run in our four verticals, so you will enjoy the same services as usual. But on top of that, we will host two of our Smart Cities Innovation Days as well, one of them being in April, the other one in October. And who has been here this October to enjoy our first Smart Cities Innovation Day might remember we brought some of the best speakers on stage from government, from startups, from corporates to talk about um, current initiatives and what's really needed uh, to succeed in smart cities. So we kindly invite you to join uh, our global events at any time, everywhere in the world. Um, so feel free to join. And if you would like to know more about the programs, you can always reach out. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you guys all. Thank Thanks. you for listening. We are handing now over to the real estate and construction side. And with that, um, I'm passing on to my dear colleague, MJ. Thank you very much, Jen. Can I get that clicker too? Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful panel and welcome everybody to the afternoon portion of our expo. We'll start off with the real estate and construction tech portion. For those of you that don't know me, my name is MJ and I help lead the real estate and construction tech program here at Plug and Play. Before we get started, just a couple logistics housekeeping items for you, for those of you that weren't here during the morning. Our hashtag, if you happen to be tweeting about us today, is PNP Winter 2019. And if you find yourself having trouble accessing Twitter because you can't get on the Wi-Fi, there's the Wi-Fi information below, no password needed. Um, so I'll leave that up there for just a little bit so you guys can connect and also tweet about this. Lastly, for the housekeeping items, we have some logistics, some tech logistics for you. LineUpper is the system that we're going to be using to vote. So when we have the startups present in a little bit, you'll be able to vote on your favorites. It also has the schedule of events going on this afternoon, as well as a bunch of details about the startups that you'll be seeing on stage, should you forget any of the information that they present to you. Also is Brella, our networking app. For those of you that want to meet some of the startups afterwards, feel free to download this. You'll be able to schedule some one-on-one -on -one meetings going forward. Here's what we can expect this afternoon. We just had a wonderful Smart City panel from Jen and our Global Smart Cities team. I'll be up here for a little bit giving us some opening remarks. Then we'll have a keynote uh, by Curtis Rogers from Brick and Mortar, followed by some startup presentations from the startups that were part of our real estate and construction tech program over the past few months. Then we'll have a couple other pieces of content for you to close out the afternoon. First is a presentation from a modular construction company called Rise, and second will be a presentation from one of our corporate partners, Stanley Black & Decker. I would first like to start by thanking all of the corporate partners that are part of our real estate and construction tech ecosystem. Without them, this really wouldn't be possible, and honestly, we have a very strong collection of corporations that have joined us, and it is really with, with them that we make this platform successful. And over the past year, we have really kept each other busy. As you can see here by the numbers, we have made about 700 introductions to startup companies over the year, whether this is through deal flows or through events or through one-on-one -on -one networking. But this has been a huge part of the year, and this is up about 30% from last year. In addition to that, we've held about 30 deal flows for these corporations, so really getting them active and really helping them solve problems that they're looking to solve. And then underlying all of that is a vast amount of startup sourcing that we've done over the past year. We've sourced close to 2,400 companies just in 2019, and this is about a 40% increase from last year. Um, and this is all in part due to the team that we have behind this, but also the active efforts of our partners. We're really excited about the gauge engagement that we have been able to facilitate between our partners and our startups, and we're excited to see where it goes in the next couple years. But behind the startup sourcing is also our investment efforts. So I'd just like to touch on a couple investments that we've made in the real estate and construction tech space this year. First of which is in a space uh, broadly efficiency. So we have invested in a few companies in that space, and I know that's kind of a broad term, but these startups range in a variety of different categories. But 
Ask Porter is one of our first portfolio investments this year. And they are focused on property management efficiency, essentially striving to be the Google assistant of property management and streamlining that whole process. Second in that space is a company called Sapient, and they are looking at energy efficiency solutions and how to reduce the amount of electricity used by electric plugs throughout a commercial building. And lastly is Oloid, and they're working on efficiencies in facial recognition and building access. The second space for us in our portfolio this year is transaction management. So we have been looking at startups in the iBuyer space. We've also been looking at startups that are complementing traditional brokerages and also just traditionally making transactions a little bit more flexible, a little bit more accessible for the average home buyer and home seller. The iBuyer space is a part of the real estate and construction program that we're really excited about just because it's on the one hand disrupting traditional brokerages, but on the other hand, it's also working to complement them. So these are a few of the portfolio companies we've invested in this year. And lastly for us is productivity. So we have looked at ways in which to primarily focus on construction productivity, ways in which to make work sites a little bit more um, efficient, to source laborers a little bit more efficiently. BuildStream is a company that we have invested in this year that's looking specifically at that, at sourcing different labor um, workers throughout the US to make these uh, construction sites more efficient. But that's a quick snapshot of our portfolio. And really all of this, all of these engagements, all of this investments that we've made, what you're seeing here today would not be possible without this team. I am just a small part of it. Um, and so I'd like to take this time to thank each and every one of our team members on the Real Estate and Construction Tech program. Uh, our team has grown a lot over the past year as well, um, and it's a privilege to work with them. Um, so I'd just like to thank them for all their hard work. And now, uh, without further ado, I will bring up our keynote speaker. Please welcome Curtis Rogers with Brick and Mortar. All right. Have you all done the clapping exercise before? We may need to wake up a little bit. I learned that uh, doing training for the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy to, you know, get people engaged in a little shared activity. Thank you very much. I'm Curtis Rogers, principal at Brick and Mortar Ventures. Uh, Brick and Mortar Ventures is a uh, construction-focused venture capital firm based here in San Francisco, but of course we're global. You can go to the next slide. I have the clicker. There we go. If that works. Try one more time. There we go. So this is our agenda for today, and. There we go, there's our mission. So really we wanna be the premier uh, global uh, design, construction, and facility O&M uh, investor uh, in, in partnership with uh, industry professionals. So we get our capital from uh, large corporations in the construction space, and uh, four out of five members of our team are actually former uh, construction professionals. So back in 2015, Brick and Mortar Ventures was founded by Darren Bechtel of the Bechtel Construction Family and he had a passion for supporting construction entrepreneurs. And about uh, four years ago, uh, he brought me on uh, to help him with his personal investments, and then we raised our first fund of outside capital, uh, just about $100 million. So my background, I started at a construction firm called Kiwit as an engineer. Kiwit is one of the largest contractors in North America. They have actually have the largest fleet of construction equipment in North America and uh, worked on power plants and light rail as an engineer, and then was put in a new role dedicated to new technology and process improvement. So for three years, it was my responsibility to define the problems that our projects were motivated to solve, pilot technology, and then deploy that and scale that throughout the business. And really enjoyed it, spent four years at Kiwit, and then I moved out here about seven years ago to join the Plan Grid team. Uh, I was their hire when they came out of Y Combinator, and it was a great experience, but I was very naive about how expensive it was to live in the Bay Area, and I moved into the cheapest place I could find, and it turned out to have bed bugs, and that was not sustainable. I uh, thought I'd ruin my life, but I was able to get a job at McCarthy Construction. McCarthy is the largest healthcare builder in North America. So for two years at McCarthy, I was dedicated again to new technology, process improvement, and really rounded out the rest of my construction experience, uh, where at Keywood I was doing nuclear weapon disassembly facilities, natural gas refineries, roads, bridges, tunnels, and then at McCarthy, 
it was healthcare, utility scale solar, laboratories, uh, parking structures, uh, that type of thing. So while I was at McCarthy, I began informally working with a number of entrepreneurs in the Bay Area, and I saw the opportunity to create the Society for Construction Solutions. So we call it SCS. You go to scscatalyst.org, and that is a nonprofit to bring together construction technologists and construction entrepreneurs and uh, investors, and that's how I met Darren. So Darren became a member, uh, we became fast friends, and then I actually pitched Darren an idea, and he interrupted me and offered me the job at Brick and Mortar Ventures. So uh, with Darren, worked with him for about two and a half years, managing his personal investments, then we had our first closing, our first uh, outside capital, and Darren brought on uh, KP in Austin. So KP also started at uh, uh, Kiewit as an engineer, and then he was a forensic structural engineer, and then he uh, co-led McKinsey's construction consulting practice. So he's a real expert when it comes to high-level strategy in construction. And then Austin has a background in investment banking and startup operations. So he brings really the, the financial acumen into our team. And then just recently we hired Alice away from a DPR, another really good construction firm. And she runs our uh, front end of the deal flow process. So any, port of, any startup companies uh, seeking investment, Alice is the first person that she's going to engage with, that they will engage with. Great. So these are our limited partners. So this is where we get our capital. When I say we raised uh, you know, capital, outside capital for our first fund, uh, these are the wonderful organizations uh, that trusted us to be stewards of their capital. And we also provide them uh, some strategic benefit. So we're measured by financial performance, and then there's also an expectation that we are going to help them uh, meet their strategic objectives. But we don't make our LPs responsible for the success of our portfolio companies and vice versa. Uh, so we definitely have the, um, the ability, uh, decision-making ability uh, and discretion over our investments. Great. So this is now getting into a little bit of the brick and mortar strategy. So we cultivate centers of influence as a major source of deal flow. And I'll take you through some examples of that. So CSIRO is the Australian National Research Lab. It's the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. And it's a, a really impressive organization. They actually invented Wi-Fi. And we knew this, and we said, wow, this is a great lab for wireless technology. We're really struggling to figure out connectivity for construction sites. You know, maybe we can learn from CSIRO. And we were very fortunate uh, to be trusted to be stewards of some of the technology that they spun out in one of our portfolio companies, Winomia, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So that's an example of a national research lab doing research in wireless technology, and then we spun out their Bluetooth uh, technology into our portfolio company, Winomia. Another great example is with NASA. We co-hosted uh, for three years a uh, NASA 3D printing uh, challenge. So we had $4 million from NASA, and we uh, helped bring together the top teams for robotics and material science uh, to help NASA understand what it'll be like to do construction on the moon and Mars. And uh, through that, we developed a relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers. And you're just, you want to embed yourself with the people actually doing inspiring uh, work and, and pushing the limits of technology. Great. So hopefully that gives you some idea about centers of influence. Now, these would be our portfolio companies. So we're up to 18 now uh, for our current fund. Some of these aren't on the website. I'm definitely showing some that, uh, you know, are, are in stealth or, you know, haven't been announced yet. The uh, latest one is advanced navigation, and um, really, these, some of these investments uh, are from uh, or kind of warehouse, and then we put into the, the new fund, um, but these are all of the investments for fund one. So really, these investments are sometimes more than a year old, uh, but January of this year is when we closed our first fund of outside capital, and then I'll get in more detail on, on some of these. This button is not reliable. Okay, so our overall deal flow process, I'll walk you through that real quick. So our, our number of leads is, is uh, totally out of control. My email is, is just out of control. But we see uh, over 1,000 uh, leads uh, a year. And then as a team, we qualify those leads. And we're pretty, we think we're unique in that we start adding value and kind of earn a seat at the table as an investor. 
So we'll ma happily make introductions. We'll give you feedback on product. We may introduce you to a co-founder, or we may be involved in the origin of the company as a spin out from a research organization. And then the prioritized leads are the ones that we're really starting to educate our managing director, Darren Bechtel, on, so he can start to familiarize himself. And really, the lens that he's looking at it through is, are other investors going to see the light? Are, are we just too focused in construction to, to see if this is a good investment opportunity? Are we, are we just you know, too interested in solving problems? Uh, are we looking at it really from a financial perspective? And will this company be as successful uh, at fundraising? Because it's very important, because this company is going to be burning cash. And then our due diligence process is really led by uh, Austin Yunt, our uh, professional on the team with the financial background. So he really does the, the deep financial dive. And then uh, often I'm doing the, the technical due diligence and research. And you know, a lot of interviewing, um, oftentimes we'll go and visit the construction projects, talk with the customers, and very often we introduce them to their customers. So we get a really front row seat into uh, seeing th what's the efficacy of this solution. And then, of course, we deploy capital out of our fund. Yep. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some broader trends going on in the construction space. And really, the core of our investment thesis is we think construction's been suffering from solution scarcity up until recently. So we think that construction has plenty of economic incentive to solve problems. We think there's plenty of smart people and think that there's uh, really plenty of, of budget at these construction projects for technology. It's just there's nothing to spend it on. You know, iPhones and iPads have only been around uh, for about a decade. And before that, there was really no effective way to get information to and from the field uh, digitally. You had to use a ruggedized laptop and uh, you know, actually physically take that to and from the field. The 4G just didn't exist. So we see a lot of enabling technology is now creating this situation of solution abundance. So these companies are now investing in heads of uh, innovation and they're setting up funds and they're getting involved with early stage companies. And we think that's just the new norm. And one of the main drivers of why technology has only now uh, risen to the, the level that construction needs is construction is done often in a GPS denied metallic dynamic environment. And that is another level of difficulty above a manufacturing environment where in manufacturing you may have GPS denied metallic environment, but it's nowhere near as dynamic as a construction project. When I put up a wall or pour concrete and put up a rebar cage, I've now created a real barrier to wireless communication and indoor positioning and just general connectivity, uh, let alone the actual deployment of the uh, infrastructure for connectivity. If you ever tried to maintain a wireless uh, mesh uh, Wi-Fi network, you know it's a real struggle to maintain all of the temporary power and you know constantly redeploy and configure the uh, the system. Right, and then how do we look at construction? So we say that construction is not an industry unto itself. We say that construction is a common process among many industries. So similar to manufacturing. And the way that we look at it is from simple to complex. So starting over on the left, this is more of the simple markets. And those vertical uh, bars really represent that we think there will be real disruption in these more simple parts of construction. So we have investments like Connect Homes. It's a totally vertically integrated company. And I'm sure you're familiar with WeWork and Katera. We think that they're in the market segments where you could be completely vertically integrated and very disruptive to the, the current market. Now, that dotted line really shows where we think there's a bit of a, of a transition. So on the, on the right-hand side, we're comfortable making investments in uh, solutions that solve a problem that's common across multiple markets. So that may be quality control or training or something like that. But we think that those markets, those construction projects are so complex, you won't see disruption, but you'll see uh, the clients demanding productivity improvement. And you just projects are really complex. There's plenty, tons of problems to solve. And because of the solution abundance, uh, now everyone's aware that there's a better way to do it, uh, as well as the new workforce entering and you know, demanding uh, you know, better, uh, pr better productivity solutions. Great. 
And this is kind of a summary of uh, what we've learned by working very closely with corporate venture capital. So this slide was put together by my business partner, uh, Kostub, and uh, he's the reason why this slide deck uh, looks a lot better than I can do. Um, you learn a lot of that in McKinsey. But this really tries to summarize how a corporation should look at getting involved with early stage companies. So you look over on the left and talk about internal resources. Are you going to really staff up your innovation team or your corporate venture capital team and have a lot of resources? If you have a lot of resources, then doing direct investment, uh, you can do that successfully. You can even get involved in tech commercialization if you want to work with a university and a research lab. But if you're going to start with lower resources, you're best to work with a partner like Plug and Play. Uh, Brick and Mortar Ventures is a great partner to corporations, uh, but that would be a kind of way to look at that spectrum. And then seeking the, the benefits. You know, it's a, it's a long-term commitment uh, to be an LP in a fund. So you're talking seven to ten years. And you need to, you know, be aware of what you're setting up and if you're going to have those resources dedicated for a long period of time. Yep. So as a rule of thumb, we would say it's best to work with early stage companies that are around the Series B stage as a, a good, safe place to play. If you're working with really, really early stage companies, uh, it is entirely possible you are going to tank that company because of your slower decision making speeds and you know you pilot it, it doesn't work out. Well, your company's fine, but that startup has been solely focused on you as a customer with limited resources. So we would really encourage you uh, to start off with a little bit later stage companies and build up those muscles and those skills and then work with earlier stage companies as you have that competency and uh, that sympathy to the entrepreneurs. Great, now the fun stuff. So we'll get into some technologies. Um, now, talked about centers of influence and a outstanding center of influence is Shell Tech Works in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So the history of this investment is when Deepwater Horizon happened, Shell saw, wow, that could have been us, and they said, we are going to go and learn how aerospace does quality control. So Draper Labs was the first organization to receive a contract for the Apollo uh, Moon Program. So they got the uh, guidance system contract at MIT, and they created Draper Labs around that contract. Now Draper Labs does uh, about half a billion dollars a year in revenue, and they do research for all the military guidance as well as many other non-military uh, programs. So Shell approached uh, Draper Labs and said, hey, here's some money, here's some problems. That was so successful that they spun that team out of Draper Labs and created Shell TechWorks. So it's a bunch of non-oil and gas professionals solving oil and gas problems out in Cambridge. Well, Matthew Kleinman was one of those Draper people that left and started Shell TechWorks. And I developed a relationship with him and with Shell TechWorks. And over the course of about two years, uh, they decided to share with us that they've been developing this technology, Cumulus, to eliminate leaks on refineries. So really what it is is a uh, enabling technology are these Bluetooth-enabled torque wrenches. So you're able to capture the torque value at the work face digitally. No punching into a system. Uh, you're, getting, you're making sure that the flange, the bolted assembly, is hitting those engineered torque values and the, the torque pattern is being followed uh, appropriately. And this has taken uh, the leaks down to zero at the facilities that this has been deployed at. So tablets and Bluetooth-enabled uh, torque wrenches. This is what made this uh, technology possible. And of course, the, the software is a bit more sophisticated than just collecting the data. Um, there's a whole workflow and is very uh, detailed, but you know, that's how you can deploy this uh, off the coast of Singapore and uh, make sure that all of your leaks are eliminated on a facility. Great. So this is one example, uh, center of influence into investment opportunity. I've got this uh, board seat that we've co-invested with uh, Shell Ventures. They've been a great partner, and uh, Cumulus is doing uh, very well, and we'll be expanding into other markets. So this logo may change, the name may change, but they started in oil and gas, and there's a lot of bolts out there. 
This is another one of our portfolio companies. This is Hollow Builder. And actually, back when I was at McCarthy Construction, I was struggling to figure out how do I document uh, subcontractors' work over time. And said, well, we can't laser scan every day. It just doesn't make any sense. So on the developer forum for the spherical cameras, I met Hollow Builder, um, just trying to find a place to organize spherical images. And they built this system that organizes spherical imagery. And what you're seeing on the left there is the user is turning on the computer vision algorithms to analyze and look for objects in the photosphere. So right now, they're looking for drywall framing. And the user is selecting the first computer vision result. And now it's taking you into the, the data set and showing you this is the first instance of drywall framing on the construction project. And then you can use that for your payment applications, schedule updates. You can see the user is updating a P6 schedule. But this is a very objective way to document progress by either self-perform subcontractors for the client. This was used to great effect by uh, a number of companies that were trying to build co-working spaces uh, around the world, but they wanted to centralize the construction management. So they reduced their cost of construction management substantially because they didn't need so many bodies on site babysitting the subcontractors. That's exactly what we were trying to solve back in McCarthy. And this became one of my first investments when I joined Air. And then you can see there's other algorithms. So this one would be for HVAC. But we would say this is in the category of tagless asset tracking. So you just can't logistically tag everything and read every barcode or get a Bluetooth or RFID tag on everything. So having a computer vision solution uh, can be really effective, and it's a far smaller data set uh, than a point cloud. Great. So this is the company we spun out of CSIRO. So CSIRO out in Australia. This company is based in Melbourne. And what they have here uh, in this photo is kind of the the basics of the system. You've got these beacons, and uh, you know, see the large uh, coin uh, batteries, and they have a over a year battery life. And instead of a persistent uh, Bluetooth mesh, it's actually it turns on and off in unison and conserves uh, energy. So it is real time communication, but it's intermittent to optimize for battery life. So it's all Bluetooth low energy. There's no proprietary protocols, um, but they're using LoRa and Bluetooth, and they're just really good at engineering it to send data packets that are really dense with information, very energy efficient, and uh, they had to make their own hardware just so it'll have the proper battery life and durability. So right now, they're really focused on material management. You can see in this visual visualization, they're using it to track facade panels. So the way that you would use this on a job site currently is you would send this to the factory, and you'd have them to start putting it on materials that's coming to your job site. And then you're going to deploy the beacons in your laydown yard and your staging areas. And now you're going to have a min-max inventory management. This is one of the core things behind the you know, Toyota manufacturing process is you know, understanding your min-max inventory, you know, Kanban, all that good stuff. So we're really excited about this company. The uh, technology is uh, not some proprietary protocol that you know, we'll never you know, get through security review. Uh, and we'll, they're doing a really great job. And they're going to expand out of just materials. This is just the current focus. So you have to remember, these companies are on a trajectory. So with Cumulus, they're starting in oil and gas. They're starting with uh, torque wrenches. But they will expand out of that. New markets, new tools, new data being collected. With Winomia, right now they're focused on uh, urban towers and focused on material management. But they're going to move into other markets. And they're going to track other things, like people and tools and equipment. And really, that's driven by the early partnerships. So their early customers are involved in the co-development and perhaps even invited uh, to invest in the next round if they're a really effective partner. So their trajectory is related to the relationship with the early corporate partners they have. And here's another one. This is Illumigear. And I'm giving you a little sneak peek. This is not released yet. Uh, this will be their new uh, Halo Spot. And this is a uh, safety device. So this illuminates uh, your work area, but it also has a ring of LEDs around your hard hat to increase your visibility. 
So great for working above ceilings, great if you're uh, working close proximity to a highway. And what's exciting about this new one is this is where we're going to start making this tool smart. So there's a little panel there on the, the bottom of it, and that's where you can get access to power and to the board. And we plan on adding some really interesting sensors and devices to this platform. So our kind of plan is we've got a device that people want to wear. This is a, a helpful thing, and we will be able to upgrade it. And then it will be up to the user if they want to be tracked, if they want to have a electromagnetic field detector and want you know, their hard hat to shake when they come into proximity of a really strong electromagnetic field. As an electrician, that would be fantastic and potentially help you avoid uh, electrocution. And then this is our latest investment, Advanced Navigation. This is related to Illumigear, but this is a, a different uh, company. And they make really sophisticated guidance technology. And we were struggling to figure out uh, indoor positioning. We had confidence that we had figured out uh, connectivity for job sites, but positioning was still a really big challenge. So we saw advanced navigation actually as a center of influence. They do guidance for submarines. They do uh, inertial guidance uh, you know, components. So what this is, is like IMUs and gyroscopes. So this is the type of technology that Draper Labs developed uh, for the Apollo program and develops for the, the US military. And it's very sensitive technology as far as like defense related, um, but it's very sophisticated. And the way that they get excellent performance and low cost is they actually use an onboard processing neural network to do error correction between all of the components of the IMU. So in an IMU, you have an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. And they run a neural network locally to do error correction and increase the performance of the IMU. So they'll be coming out with a new fiber optic gyroscope. This is a gyroscope that's so sensitive it can detect the rotation of the Earth. And this will be uh, order of magnitude cheaper than any other fiber optic gyroscope. And we see a great uh, potential for that for indoor surveying and positioning. They uh, make a lot of money you know, doing work for underwater guidance. And they decided to make their own underwater inspection robot. So any uh, civil infrastructure underwater, telecommunications, oil and gas, you know, subsea assets. Uh, they're really experts at that. And then they've also got a phased array ultra wideband technology that they're just starting to, to research and, and you know, test in the wild, so to speak. So one of the things that we want to do is take the advanced navigation IMUs and then add them to the Illumigear halo, the spot. And then now you've got a tool for time studies. When I was an engineer, you know, you've got a big operation, or maybe you've got multiple floors of a high rise. There's no way to track the location of all the workers and then discuss that as a team. You have to sit there with a clipboard and figure it out. So we think we've got a, a really good approach that requires no infrastructure, and the workers will actually want to wear it. So this breaks down a little bit of what the IMU is and, and how it works. So, so real-time uh, locating system, RTLS. There's one way to think about it where you're using wireless signals to triangulate a position of a tag. So you've got an omnidirectional tag, and you've got all these, these beacons, and you're positioning yourself. It's very difficult to maintain this infrastructure. Hospitals do it all the time, but it's a lot more difficult while you're building the hospital. So this is the approach that we're taking. You need much less infrastructure just to provide connectivity, but you're relying upon the IMU, the inertial measurement unit, for the positioning. So we're really breaking up that equation where the real time is the wireless system and the location sensing is an inertial sensor. Yep, so that's the approach that we've uh, kind of developed over the years as we tried that and it is not scalable. This is another one of our portfolio companies called Canvas. So getting out of the world of, of wireless and tools, now we've got a uh, robot that finishes drywall. And they're actually a subcontractor. So if you've got a lot of interior work to do, a lot of drywall, they would happily be your preferred subcontractor. Yep. So right now, they develop relationships with large contractors or large clients that have a large volume of work. And they want to have the best interior walls possible 
or they just have a large volume and they need to reduce cost. So this is a very productive robot. But you can't just sell this machine to a contractor. They would, it's too disruptive to the overall process. You're going to change your material process. You're going to change your crew composition. So they had to adapt and become their own subcontractor. They partner with the labor unions, and they can uh, build their own teams and take this robot out there and do interior construction very efficiently. Here's Connect Homes. So if you're interested in modular and prefab, we think that Connect Homes is pretty much the most efficient construction firm on the planet. So they've got a VP of operations formerly from Toyota and Airbus, and they've got a true production line. And there's just the right constraints to make this a scalable business. So they leverage the intermodal shipping network. They don't allow a lot of design freedom. And they've got the production down to true work bay production. So when you think about some of the complexity drivers for construction, you know, material management, supply chain, this is how sophisticated their material management you know, needs to be. It's, it's very efficient, and each worker gets to work in a work bay, controlled environment, predictable commute to work. It's, you're taking out a lot of those complexity drivers from construction. Now, they make single family homes now, but like all of our other companies, they're on a trajectory. So getting into multifamily is absolutely a possibility. And selling a factory is absolutely a possibility. But right now, we call it a center of excellence down in LA. They're in San Bernardino. And this is where a lot of our portfolio companies go and support them in trying to really drive efficiency. And then once they have that efficiency, then we can get more creative in the financing and more creative with the business model. Here's a great example of a emerging technologies, not our portfolio company, uh, being used at Connect Homes to drive efficiency. So this is someone wearing the, the HoloLens and then another person in VR back at the design office. And instead of commuting through LA traffic, they are having a conversation and resolving a waterproofing problem together in a Unity simulation. So HoloLens user is there at the work face, and the designer is back in the office. And they're instructing them on how do you properly uh, waterproof a window. Yep. So you can imagine how fast it is to teach somebody to the desired level of competency. There's branch technology. This is our 3D printing investment. They won one of the major parts of the NASA competition. And again, on a trajectory, they were making basically anything you want. And now they make building facades. So if you've spent a lot of money on custom-made building facades, they now can 3D print the world's best and lowest cost uh, building facades. They could also do interior acoustic panels. But now this is the market they're solely focused on. Thank you very much for your time, and feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you very much, Curtis. All right, next we have startup presentations from the startups that went through our program. And to kick that off, I'd like to welcome your MC for the afternoon, Marcelino. All righty, thank you. My name is Marcelino. Uh, I've seen some familiar faces, but for those that don't know me, my name is, uh, well, once again, Marcelino. I'm the Ventures Analyst on the Real Estate and Construction team. We only have about six startups, but they're, they're working on some pretty amazing technology. I know we have various industries here, uh, but I just want to remind everybody to put your votes in. Uh, we're going to give you a couple minutes after the last startup goes. Uh, real estate and construction is a uh, part of everyone's lives, so I just want to let everybody know it'd be nice for everybody. Just put your votes in. If you like the technology, if you find it interesting, just put a vote in. We want to select the best uh, startup out here today. So without further ado, please excuse my big paper. Uh, we're going to kick it off with Occupier. Occupier is a building software to enable businesses to make real estate decisions. Please welcome Andrew. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrew Flint. I'm the co-founder of Occupier. We are a real estate optimization platform for commercial tenants uh, and their brokers. 
Um, real estate is often the second largest expense for any business out there, uh, easily north of 10 to $20 million annually for mid-market companies and can be easily north of a billion dollars a year for enterprise businesses. Uh, by the end of 2020, these companies and six million total across the United States are gonna be required to account for these real estate expenses on their balance sheet like never before based upon new accounting standards. Additionally, um, these companies have not done a uh, sufficient job in adapting their real estate portfolios to the changing dynamics and how their employees work uh, and how they meet customer expectations. Uh, the result of this is that 30 to 50% of space is underutilized. This means that companies are spending way too much on real estate and they're not operating as efficiently as they should. These two factors alone are forcing companies to completely rethink their real estate strategies. Um, do they lease or do they buy? Uh, if they lease, do they do long-term leases or do they leverage kind of the flexible spaces of service options out there? Um, how do they continue to optimize the use of their space? And now how much do they spend on it? The legacy tools out there don't really support these decisions to optimize space use. They're poorly designed. They don't facilitate an easy way to collect information and then access it. Um, and they don't foster the collaboration that is required across multiple stakeholders uh, in how these decisions are made. Introducing Occupier. So Occupier enables companies to make better real estate decisions that align with their key business initiatives, um, uh, sorry, uh, key business initiatives. Um, it helps promote growth for their business uh, and it also helps mitigate a ton of risk for them. We do that by making it super easy for you to start to collect and access the most relevant information around your portfolio, whether it's with your existing leases or the deals that you're working on. Uh, it fosters collaboration, not just with the people internally in your organization, but with your brokers as well. Uh, eliminates a lot of the duplica duplicative work that people do um, in managing portfolios through automation and helps leverage data. And all of this is paving the way to really rethink real estate and create the first demand marketplace for, commercial, uh, for the real estate industry. We have a really good um, set of early customers, the likes of Indeed, Bluestone Lane, um, franchise owners of name brands like Five Guys, uh, a lot of brokers uh, from the, uh, the largest firms across the country like CBRE, JLL, Cushman and Wakefield, um, and Newmark and more. And these are all kind of fostering what will be um, a huge market opportunity by 2023, $4.6 billion in the US, over $13 billion globally for lease management software. We have a great team that's helping drive this, um, deep expertise in both commercial real estate and prop tech. Uh, and we've got great backing from Thomson Reuters Ventures, Elite Partners, and a lot of the top industry professionals from across the United States. Um, thank you very much. Please come find us upstairs. Um, we look forward to talking to you about it further. Thank you, Andrew. So up next, we have uh, Preframing. Preframing offers the fastest and least expensive software and hardware solution from initial design to wall framing. Please welcome Mauro. Thank you, everybody. My name is uh, Mauro Sica, CEO and founder of Preframing. We offer the fastest and least expensive solution for uh, wall framing. So traditionally, during the construction process, a large percentage of time is wasted just uh, reading blueprints, measuring, marking, moving lumber around, and moving it back. Our solution, starting from a floor plan, we generate a two-dimensional and three-dimensional model of the framing. Then we send this information to our machines that they marks, cuts, and pre-space the lumber. So on site, uh, the builder can pull the wall out accordion style, then position and nail the bottom and top plate, complete the cutting of these uh, partially pre-cut studs. So the machine almost cut completely, but not quite. But on site, it's very easy to put everything together. In this case, the window seal and uh, the pre-marked header if it's not structural. The system is uh, 10 times uh, faster than traditional construction on site. 
This is another example with a door opening. So we solve four problems. Workforce shortage, mistakes, inefficiencies, and scrap. We provide a solution to the shortage uh, along with 10 times uh, faster installation, which equates uh, to an overall 45% savings uh, compared to traditional prefab. Plus, we save 1 million trees every year. One of our competitive advantages is uh, taking an entire factory and squeeze it inside a portable shipping container. On the top, you see existing comparable equipment uh, below our machine, which uh, you can see is much smaller, requires only one operator, is, and instead of six, is one-tenth of the cost, uh, and automates 90% uh, versus a maximum of 70% of the overall process. So long term, uh, we want to go further this. This is our first product. We want to provide the tremendous values to the builders. What you see here in blue is uh, what we want to develop, uh, offering a total solution from the initial architectural design to the wall framing. So on top, we see the Area Builder Pro plugin. This is a software able to collect uh, in real time directly during the design process by, made by architects and engineers all the information we need for the next steps. So this virtually eliminates the need to manually process blueprints which we will print uh, with our layout printer robot. This is a device able to, like a Roomba, able to print out uh, in actual scale the blueprints directly on the floor. And this is our latest uh, product, uh, the metal stud wall system. So traditionally during this process, uh, the builder needs to cut every component uh, at length, mark the layout, uh, position and screw every component. So this takes uh, a minimum of one hour for a small wall with one door opening. Our system, mini, mini wall prototype simple. So this is a, a automatically fabricated screwless system with the proprietary snapping system. This is very simply 30 times faster. So on site for the first time, it will be possible to mark the layout uh, with a robot uh, and fabricate walls uh, starting from the raw material, and uh, not only that, uh, raising walls in minutes uh, instead of hours. Empowering builders to do more and address the housing crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauro. So up next, we have Vire. Vire automates modeling and web visualization, adapting to 3D that can be accessible to all. Please welcome Nils. Hi. I've come here today all the way from Sweden, and I find it mind-blowing that I could locate and navigate to this building here in California without asking a single person. All I needed was my smartphone and Google Maps. Now, it's, it's only like we've started to take for granted how incredible this is, that when a few years ago we needed you know, big map books, now we can just any person in the world can bring out their phone and find any bar, any park, any hotel in any city. It's like su superhuman abilities. Now, compare this kind of outdoor map, with all those search and the filtering, to what we find to be the standard for our buildings. There are no superpower in buildings. We use PDFs. That's not only not very non-modern, but it's extremely painful for the professionals that work in our building, the facility managers. The property owners give them this as a tool to annotate you know, when they're responsible to keep track of all the smoke detectors, all the ventilation units, all that data that there are thousands of products that they're expected to keep track of in a PDF. Not only is this very painful for the facility manager that doesn't really have, you know, the tools he, uh, he needs to do his job properly, but it creates an amount, a, a tremendous amount of inefficiencies in the buildings where you need 50 facility managers instead of just uh, the 25 that you normally need if you had better tools. So it's extremely costly for the, for the property owners. So at Vire, we've created a, a web app, a, a platform that is exactly, well, it's Google Maps, but for your building in 3D. And we enable this by 
taking BIM models that are left from new buildings and just uploading it to our user-friendly and mobile web platform so the facility managers can access their data. Most property owners don't have a lot of BIM models, so we also have a pipeline for mass conversion of old floor plans into BIM models that, well, get you started straight away, no matter who you are. And then for collecting and updating all the information about the building, we, set, we click share to the facility managers that, well, now they have a modern tool where they can add all the card readers, all the smoke detectors, and they do this happily because it's a modern tool. So we get thousands of data points per building in a day uh, for buildings all over the world. And you can add you know, metadata about that, about that card reader or whatever you're adding. So we enable drastic reduction of cost for data collection by enabling crowdsourcing, basically. And we integrate with other systems you know, to make the models live for temperatures, CO2 issues. And I'm very happy to be here today because basically coming to Plug and Play has enabled us to m meet these super cool companies, so Kojima and KBD. And uh, well, they're just very forward and they have a bunch of these 3D models, these BIM models. So what we do is that we take them and we upload them to our platform, making the data you know, user-friendly and accessible. And then the facility managers who just access it from their iPad or desktop or whatever, can search to find whatever information that they need. So you have you, you recognize the object, you know you find all the information from uh, from the BIM. But what's important is that you add new layers of data beyond the BIM. It's the it's the photos, it's the instructions, it's the the dates for inspections, all these things that you need in practice beyond the BIM model. If you work in real estate, I'd be super happy if you just send me an email. My email's right there, and just. Let us help you get started. Or, or come find me after this, and uh, uh, we'll get you started on the road to get the same thing happening for all of your buildings. And then not only will all your facility, manager, facility managers have you know, an incredibly reduced and less painful day, but you'll start making incredible uh, efficiency enabling uh, maneuvers for, for your facility maintenance team. And if you want to try the product yourself, you can just scan it here using your QR code scanner. Um, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Nils. Just a quick reminder again, uh, after we have three more startups after that, we're gonna give you a couple minutes to just put your votes in and then we can announce the winner. Uh, so remember, uh, you can scan the QR codes behind your badges and just put in a quick vote. So up next, we have Fairfleet. Fairfleet offers on-demand drone inspections and smart data analytics for many different industries. Please welcome Alexander. Hi, my name is Alex. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Fearfleet, and what Fearfleet is all about, I'll show you right now. So in general, um, all real estate owners, all investors, all real estate companies, all construction companies, they need information and pictures about their assets. In general, if most of these companies are very global, it's hard to gather information of these assets globally. And um, there's millions of real estate agents out there that take pictures from millions and billions of properties, um, and that is a pain for them. Additionally, a lot of these companies want to use aerial data somehow, but you have to buy a drone yourself, you have to get the training, and you have to get the licensing and the permissions, which is, in some cases, a huge pain, and if you lose your drone, all your investments are somehow lost. So what we came up with, is an online platform where you can order a book drone as a service. You can easily go to a website, book a, ser a standardized service globally within 30 seconds. We'll send the request out to one of our local drone pilots in 55 countries. The drone pilot will collect the data, send it to us, we'll do the post-processing, and then we'll send it back to the client. And how it works, that's it. So the client goes to a website, in this case, one large real estate company named JLL, they go to the website, they have standardized services, they can book their standardized service in an area, let us know when and where. We'll do all the approvals and the pilot sourcing. We'll create a mission for the pilot, send out the local pilot, he will capture the data, upload the data to our system, and we'll do the post-processing, and they will get the results delivered immediately. With our Global clients, we have developed these products within the last two years. So in real estate, it's a lot of marketing stuff, but now we do more technical stuff. So we do a lot of facade and roof inspections. Um, we do due diligence, as an example, for Deutsche Bank. 
um, before they invest in properties, we actually analyze the properties and see if they have any defects or damages. In infrastructure, we did a lot of inspection for um, progress monitoring of construction sites. We um, can actually do an entire 3D model and send it back to the client. In agriculture, we also work in plant health analytics and counting plants, and we do the same things we do for due diligence for insurance companies. So these are our main services in real estate and construction. It's a lot of marketing stuff, right? Visualizations. Um, we do 3D models of buildings and construction monitoring. It's easy. You can go through our website, pay as you go, or if you really like it, which 80% of our clients do, um, they go, actually, that was wrong. <laughs> it's 80% of our bookings are recurring bookings. I hope that more than 80% of our clients like our service. Um, and if they like it, they can go through an enterprise white label solution where they can integrate their services directly to their processes. This is us. Um, this is our fourth batch in um, plug and play. So a lot of the corporates liked it, and we're working with them very closely. If you'd like to learn how you could use drone data, I uh, will be upstairs, and I will be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. All righty, thank you, Alexander. Up next, we have Passive Logic. They have developed an autonomous platform that improves building efficiency and operations. Please welcome Troy. Thanks, Thanks Marcelino. So Passive Logic is the first fully autonomous platform for buildings, and we've rolled it all into the one thing every building needs, a control system. We democratize building automation for your average installer while solving not just automation of control, but the automation of buildings from design, build, operate, maintain, and manage. Buildings are the largest controlled infrastructure in the world. They're also the most complex. And yet, today, we're controlling them with technology that's decades old, really, really dumb, and incapable of solving those problems with even the largest programming team. And smart building technology, in quotes, isn't really smart, is it? This is a euphemism for connected. And as these smart solutions grow, we're having these islands of IoT devices without any organizing intelligence for buildings that can control a building as a whole system. So at Passive Logic, we approach this problem by solving all of these challenges together with some of the main pain points that customers experience in building a new automation platform built on some new technology and built it on top of physics-based digital twins, giving the control system the idea of what buildings are, how they work, and how to control them. And we rolled this into something that was plug and play that an average installer can just plug in and it will walk them through the whole installation process right on screen. We've pre-integrated everything you need into one box, reducing 90% of the labor of getting automation into a building. And it works just like this. You import your BIM or CAD, or you draw right in our system, and we generate deep digital twins about the physics of the building. That enables us to guide the whole installation process with a digital workflow right on site, checkpointing every wire, checkpointing how the system goes together and commissioning the system as a whole. We provide real-time control autopilot. This isn't fixed control sequences from 10 years ago when somebody wrote a program. In real time, we generate those control sequences, and we're seeing 30% energy savings from better control. We enable each occupant to have their own human comfort model based around the physiology of true comfort, not just air temperature. We generate the analytics and insights about the building all automatically without any extra programming effort and we make it one click to add your building to your whole building portfolio so you can maintain, manage, and track what's going on in your building. When we compare this to what's happening in the marketplace today, we looked at the market and said the inevitable outcome of buildings, like all verticals, is full autonomy. And when we compare what we're doing at Passive Logic to the competition, there's a big gap in technology between us and the next competitors. In the last 10 weeks since we came out of stealth mode, we've signed $90 million in commitments from customers all around the world. And we encourage you to come join us up at our booth and see how Autonomous Building Platform can help you in your workflow and your business.
Thank you, Troy. So, last startup we have is Fion. They have created the over-the-air wireless power and data platform to enable intelligent and fully autonomous environments. Please welcome Jonathan. Raise your hand if you've never searched frantically for a power cord or an outlet to charge your device before it dies. Because if you haven't, I want to know your secret in the back. I'm John Nidell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fion Technologies. And we are making power as freely accessible as data by untethering devices from power cords and pads. We've created an over-the-air wireless charging system capable of delivering significant power and data to devices big and small, coupled with a simple power-as-a-service management tool. From sensors to robots, our technology intelligently scales up or down the delivery depending on the device and its requirements. Through patented infrared technology, delivery stays consistent and efficient whether the device is one foot to 30 feet away. Within the same platform, we offer secure two-way communication between the receiving device and the user. And most importantly, we've proven it to be completely safe for use in all environments for all users. In the next five years, there'll be over 75 billion IoT devices worldwide that will allow us to create truly connected facilities. Companies that are currently using IoT devices understand the pain and the labor cost of monitoring and replacing batteries. And when the only other option is to wire out the devices, smart infrastructure of the future is neither sustainable nor cost effective. With our technology, you can literally set it and forget it. So in addition to eliminating electrical wiring, as well as reducing the recurring maintenance costs of monitoring batteries, we can also drive down electrical costs by reducing what's called phantom load power consumption. There are a number of competitors in this space, and while some may offer the delivery of power over distance, they lack delivering meaningful power. Others may deliver meaningful power, but they lack the ability to do so over distance. Only fine combines meaningful power over distance in a safe way. Smart infrastructure of the future is dependent on structure, system, services, and management. And the way power is distributed throughout the facility is important to these four elements. Structure in reconfigurable or modular workspaces, now that electrical wiring isn't required. Systems in which devices brought into the facility or installed have access to power on demand. Services, with power as a service being an extra line of revenue through commoditizing a user benefit. And management, an effective technology to manage battery charging extends device lifetime. We also add, product, push the productivity boundaries at the construction site. We can uh, eliminate construction wiring to increase productivity while decreasing trip hazards, to monitor and control power distribution and device tracking, and to construct more efficiently by leveraging our charging platform to allow us to increase efficiency and decrease bill of material cost. Our first generation technology will come out as transmitter receiver kits. The transmitter plugging directly into a standard outlet or in parallel with a facility wireless, or a receiver that's USB-C connected. So it gives the user ultimate flexibility in the charging application. We're extremely excited about our initial technology pilot and partnership opportunities. As transmitters and receivers will be deployed in living in workspaces, it gives users the ability to interact with our technology directly and businesses to benefit from our service. We have a great team from building rockets to large-scale social media platforms to mass-produced hardware. We leverage the technology background and the customer-facing understanding to build global technology systems. In short, we build a revolutionary platform, and we're interested in engaging with those who want to join our journey. If interested, reach out to us on the email on the screen or come find us after the pitches. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm just going to give you guys about a minute or two to just put in those last minute votes. Um, and then I'll come back on stage, announce the winner, and then we can go ahead and move on and we can go ahead and get started with IoT. So about a minute or two. And then just remember, it's either line upper or uh, the QR code on the, badge of, on the back of your badges. A minute or two, and then I'll come back upstairs. 
real estate is one of the biggest industries in the world, why do we not see more tech coming into real estate? And what are some of the impediments? What are the opportunities? And what's the timing now? It's been an amazing journey. When I come to Silicon Valley, I really enjoy the open-minded spirit of the people. And they listen to what you have to say. And if they don't see any touch points to help you, then they say, hey, but I have this friend. So it's all about collaboration, listening, being open-minded, and try to push boundaries. We're really interested in finding new sources of growth, serving our customers with new business models and new technology. So we really need to open the aperture. Plug and Play has a fantastic ecosystem and network and we're really interested in exploring that. It's great to see where the startups have gone from selection day. Great opportunity for us to connect with other corporate partners and understand what their challenges and pain points are and how we can potentially collaborate. Collaboration is one of the biggest things that drives the architecture design industry as well as the construction industries and this is a great place to do that. It's a small investment in time and the potential for payoff is tremendous. We started as a very small company and Plug and Play connected us with a lot of investors and also with a lot of partners and it has been a great journey with Plug and Play. I've been having a lot of very interesting meeting with both insurance and real estate players. You get so many more connections than you would ever get at your own office. I, I think there's a need for the real estate to adopt new technology. In the next 40 years, humans need to build as much housing and infrastructure as we did in the last 4,000 years. And the only way we're going to meet that production is to implement technology into the construction industry, to make it more efficient, to make your team of 50 have the effectiveness of a team of 500 people. That's the only way we're going to meet all this need. Really loved hearing from each of the, the startups and the quick sound bites of three minutes. Curtis from CBRE was fantastic, giving us insight into the whole real estate and construction space, where the opportunities are, where the challenges are, and where we think these startups can start adding a lot of value. The quality of the startups and the quality of the corporation and the pitches are very, very good. Good startups join plug and play and then more good corporations come in because they see the quality. Plug and play has made a great ecosystem, I would say, to connect startups with the corporate partners. The quality of people that not only work here, but also they interact and partner with, I think there's a lot of value to just be around here and be associated with plug and play. It's a Silicon Valley mindset that a lot of people try to describe. It's actually hard to describe. You have to experience it yourself. Alrighty, so, whoops, apologies. We have the winner. Awesome. So I lied, we actually have two speakers before we pass it over to IOT. So for those that left, hopefully they make it back in here in a couple minutes. Uh, but for the winner, uh, I mean, I would ask for a drum roll. The claps were a little quiet earlier, but if you guys can um, just give me a little drum roll just really quickly, please. Alrighty, and the winner is Preframing. All righty, welcome on stage, Madhav. You do you want to say a couple words? Thank you very much. Thank you. I was not expecting this. Like, uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for being here to listening to this and uh, possibly uh, can contribute uh, collaborating together. A lot that, uh, I know that here there are a lot of corporations, uh, very large ones, so to actually make the industry more efficient, which uh, we all believe uh, needs that very much. So I want to sincerely thank you to be here and also for voting for, for preframing. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Maro, and thank you everyone for putting your votes in. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague MJ again, and we'll get started with the last speakers. Thank you very much, Marcelino. All right, to round out the afternoon for real estate and construction tech, we have two speakers for you. First, I would like to welcome on stage Greg from Rise Modular. Thanks, MJ. And uh, thank you all for having me here today. Plug and play, uh, great venue. Uh, I'm excited to talk to this group. Literally, uh, I'm a 12-time entrepreneur. 
and I started in tech about 30 years ago, and a lot of telecom, technology, infrastructure, platforms, and three and a half years ago, a couple guys talked to me about building houses and multi-tenant structures in a factory. And literally the first thing I thought of was a platform, a tech platform. And I got really uh, excited about technology in a factory, in construction, and uh, went really deep into that world. And three and a half years later, uh, we've got a company that is you know, leading in the space. We're building multi-tenant structures, we're building hotels, we're building uh, schools, we're building just about anything you can build in a factory. Uh, we've got about 250,000 square feet under roof right now. That's expanding to over a million square feet in the next year. So the biggest thing that I want to talk to this group about, about was, you know, technology and construction, which, you know, none of us obviously uh, five years ago thought a lot about. And the barriers to entry and what's happening and why it's happening and, you know, what's enabling us to move a lot of things forward. You know, the last hundred years, I don't have to say much. You know, not much has changed from a standpoint of technology and construction. You know, it's, it's been operating the same way for, since the 1900s. You know, add to that labor shortages that we have all over the industry, uh, limited R&D that's being spent. When you look at a $1.3 trillion industry and less than 1% is being spent in R&D, as we all know, uh, you don't have a lot of innovation that comes out of it. You know, fast forward to 2019. You know, I, I grew up in the telecom world when I was a young kid and literally watching the telecom world go from analog to digital is how I would describe the construction industry today. It's going through a digital transformation. And that is so exciting on so many fronts. Obviously, you have, you know, complete disruption. You have, you know, new products, process, software, hardware, services, and even totally new business models. You know, when you look at the digitization opportunity, you know, overall in the, in the entire, across the globe, it's about $1.6 trillion. And output from the global construction industry is expected to rise from 12.7 trillion in 2022 up from 10.6 trillion in 2017. And despite the promising outlook, we all know, the industry, industry has only gained 1% of productivity in the last 20 years because of the lack of digitization. I noticed a typo in here, so I, I'm, I'm happy to say we're better builders than we are spellers. But uh, the big thing here, you know, I wanted to show is just from a disruption standpoint, you know, machine learning, AI, I mean, in so many different aspects of the industry itself. When you look at stats, I mean, 52% of innovation leaders say that, you know, AI and machine learning, you know, will be commonplace in the market over the next five years. I mean, that, that blows me away and is exciting at the same time when you think about where we are today from a technological standpoint. You know, the same thing goes from, you know, from a sus sustenance standpoint of digitization. You know, 72% of construction companies believe that those who do not adopt digital ways of working will go out of business. Again, you know, when you think about five years ago compared to today, it's a pretty amazing and remarkable statement. 72% of the people say that, that were, you know, in the survey. And, you know, the transformation, you know, 89% of people agree that digitization will transform the way we work, each of us. We all see it every single day, you know, today. And adoption, you know, the sector is still way behind other sectors when it comes to adopting digital technology. I think that we all see that in our walks of life. And again, when you look at the, you know, barriers to that technological, you know, advancement, you know, lack of staffing, budget, employee hesitance, you know, management, lack of knowledge about new tech, maturity of tech and availability, or, you know, no, we try everything out. I mean, I, I, I don't know so many people that have that 11% view of no, we try everything out. And then from an adoption standpoint, we are seeing obviously massive changes, uh, you know, from BIM and, you know, basic data an analytics and project management information systems, you know, kind of down the road. But obviously when you look at the bottom of this list, there is a lot of room for improvement a lot of room to continue to push things. You know, Rise, like I said, you know, we literally are a technology-based off-site construction company. And, you know, our concept of what we are doing is creating the first end-to-end -end build platform to design, build, deliver modular multi-tenant structures at scale. And what that means is we take it from, you know, the front-end side of, you know, the permitting aspect, architectural, engineering, building, deployment, and we build everything in our factory. 
And what that does for us is obviously creates you know, massive you know, aspects of efficiencies by being able to do site work building simultaneously with the in-site factory building. And that literally increases the time that a structure is built. It, it makes it a lot faster. Like I talked about here, you know, the idea that we have is this front end, the end to end aspect. You know, we literally work every single thing. A developer can come to us and literally, you know, talk about building a multi-tenant structure. We can design that for them. We can do all the engineering. We can build it and we can actually erect it on site. And in the hotel world, we're actually installing all the furniture and fixtures in those structures before we ship them out of our factory. So a Marriott AC hotel, 200 rooms, we build in our factory. We literally put it on site, and it has all the furniture, the beds, the fixtures, everything in the facility when we're done with our part of the job. So we have been using robotics. We've been using all aspects of you know, various technologies in our builds. You know, we build with steel. We use steel welding robots, grinding robots. We use software technology. We're constantly looking for technologies. And that's really why I'm here today. We have a group of our company called Rise Labs. As an entrepreneur, we want to be your first customer. We want to deploy the technology that you create into our structures, into our builds, into our concepts. We want to work with you. We'll invest in you. We'll partner with you. You know, what, what we believe is that together we all rise. The idea of the construction technology industry, the way I think of it, is a lot of coopetition, cooperation, collaboration, the aspect of many great ideas coming together to do these things more efficiently and better. So I thank you for your time. Greg Welch, the founder and CEO of Rise Modular. Thank you very much, Greg. And to close us out, I would like to invite our partner, Stanley Black & Decker, up on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There, you go. Okay. there we go. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Plug & Play. It's a real pleasure to be here to uh, share what I hope is a, uh, a success in the making. I'm pretty confident it's a success in the making, our partnership with, uh, with DPAL. So DPAL is a company that we discovered as we joined the Accelerator last year. And I want to just share with you our experiences. It's been a fantastic, quick nine months. And just to get us started, uh, Stanley Black & Decker, again, you know us for our, our brands such as DeWalt, Craftsman, Stanley. Um, we have other businesses. We have a security platform. We also have an industrial uh, manufacturing uh, part of our business. But then there's Stanley X. We represent Stanley X, which is an externally facing organization stood up to find new sources of growth for the company. Okay? So we planted our flag out here in Silicon Valley about a year ago and have been getting immersed in the ecosystem. Plug and Play has been a critical partner in that. So again, I want to extend my thanks to the team for that. And again, I think this talk will demonstrate a lot of the benefits that come out of this relationship. So in Stanley X, as I said, uh, new sources of growth for the company. We're about 175 year, years old. Uh, we need to evolve and adapt, and that's what our mission is. We're focused on three broad areas uh, that are aligned to finding those new sources of growth or countering disruption that's coming towards us. Um, we've got an additive manufacturing platform, construction technology, which makes a lot of sense, uh, and then this new platform that we'll talk about today, talent services. The skilled trades uh, shortage is a crisis. Greg mentioned it. Pretty much any presentation you talk, uh, you, you hear about this macro trend. Uh, I would characterize it as a crisis. Uh, and with the rise of AI and robotics, um, I know there's some schools of thought that say we're going to start putting people out of work, but I think uh, it's, we're likely to see, especially in the skilled trades, uh, the shortage continue. So companies like us are very serious about this. We have um, a purpose for those who make the world. It's critical for us, for our customers, for us, for our growth, and we're dedicated to helping solve that skilled um, labor shortage. Uh, we started that. We started that last uh, about a year and a half ago with a labor sourcing platform called Sure, uh, sure Hand. 
and Surehand is focused on the inspection trades today in oil and gas, uh, but will soon be spreading out into construction and other verticals. So that's helping folks in the industry find work. The other element that we are starting to focus on with the help of DPOW is training and upskilling, okay? And that's exactly where uh, DPOW sits, okay? So let me tell you a quick bit about this. I won't do them justice. Fantastic uh, young organization that spun out of Siemens. Uh, they're still seed stage. Uh, and what their solution does is it leverages uh, AI, computer vision, and natural language processing to capture tasks, work tasks, and rapidly turn that into training material, okay? So using that technology, folks can record work tasks, turn it into work instructions that becomes tagged, searchable, and on demand. We've begun to pilot it within our organization, are seeing some pretty exciting results. Um, some of the use cases pretty obvious uh, in a lot of our uh, industries and, uh, and functions, we work on tribal knowledge. And it's pretty tough to pass that on to the younger generations. As we know, with the skilled labor shortage, we've got a lot of very smart, experienced people who are unfortunately leaving the trades. And we don't have enough people coming in. It's critical that as they come in and we, we want to get people up to speed, they have the, um, the tools and the resources and content. So, you know, there's documenting and memorializing these work instructions. Uh, they're sharing this tribal knowledge. And then there's just getting the whole ecosystem ramped up with the right kinds of content. We're seeing it uh, through our pilots where we can generate the content with this application, which is exciting, but we can also work with our partners upstream, the OEMs, to ask and encourage them to create the right kind of content to deliver with their services and solutions. So there's a, mu there's a multitude of different types of use cases uh, that we're excited about leveraging internally as well as uh, commercializing uh, with DPAL. So just to give you a little sense of our journey and how we got here, um, in Stanley X, we have a, a team that's dedicated to uh, uncovering those important spaces to be focusing on. As I said, this macro trend of skilled labor shortage isn't a tough one to see. Uh, but uh, to find the right way to play in that space uh, took a little doing, I would say. And we did come to a solution um, or a, a set of pain points that needed to be solved um, that this technology could, could uh, address. We, we identified that about a year and a half ago, uh, kind of put it on the shelf until we got here and came across DPAO who had the technology and the expertise. And so we married that up. Uh, and then began piloting this within Stanley Black & Decker. We've currently rolled out in two business units, uh, and in the new year we'll be in a third uh, business unit. So um, this happened very rapidly. Uh, we got introduced to DPAO last spring, and, and here we are working on uh, the commercial agreement. Um, you know, I think uh, at this point, I've rambled on. I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a better taste or some flavor of what this uh, solution is. And we've got a video that we actually put together for our board of directors. This is that important to our organization that we wanted to expose them to, uh, to this technology early on. So, uh, Tiffany, what do I need to do here? As technology continues to rapidly evolve, people are learning in new ways for going printed manuals and PDFs, turning to more engaging resources online. And as long-term employees move towards retirement, it's vital to capture their expertise, their tricks of the trade and know-how, transferring their invaluable skills to the next generations. This is DPOW, the first AI solution for learning and training skilled trades. While experts perform their individual tasks and processes, DPAL captures their workflows via a mobile device. Using the latest AI technology, this captured data is extracted and ingested, turning complex workflows into easy to follow step-by-step -step guidelines. Core of our solution is an AI system called Stephanie. Stephanie, show me bleeder valve. Stephanie, speak Spanish. Transportadores E1 para el funcionamiento a la derecha. 
New employees can access critical training information anytime, anywhere from the DeepHow online portal. Learning intricate tasks at their own pace without disrupting other workers or interrupting plan operations. Thanks to DeepHow, we're accelerating learning, increasing productivity, and empowering individuals and teams with everything they need for success. So, um, lots of excitement, lots of potential here. Um, look forward to keeping you all updated as we go forward. Um, but I do want to share a few of our learnings. Um, I would say, we're, you know, as I said, we, we've been at this about a year and a half in Stanley X. This strategy of partnering with uh, startups and, and piloting within the company, again, relatively new to us. I know some of the folks, uh, our partners out here, have been doing this for a while. Um, but this is what, you know, a few of the takeaways from the experience. Um, I would highly recommend if you have uh, strategic initiatives that can be aligned uh, to, the, to the technology you're talking about rolling out, you know, go through the effort to, to make that alignment. Ours happen to be Industry 4.0. We've been up and running with Industry 4.0 for about two years, uh, and this was, this was natural. So that got us some immediate traction and ability to get some uh, visibility to it. You've got to have a dedicated champion within the company. Um, we're kind of a skeleton crew. We made it happen within Stanley X um, to try to go and interact with various business units. Um, it takes, takes some time and effort. So I would uh, highly recommend you, you, you find that person, that champion that can connect and project manage uh, this thing to get it over the, uh, over the hump. Uh, startups, um, I think DPOW is a model for how to, you know, being a great partner to work with, be easy to work with. Um, the big companies aren't, so you kind of got to need to. Um, but uh, DPOW did a fantastic uh, job there. And then be ready. Um, don't be that dog that caught the car. Um, we've got a lot of excitement, and uh, we, needed our, um, we needed our partner to be ready to roll out uh, when our business unit said yes, and they were. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I look forward to anybody uh, reaching out if you have questions, um, but thanks for the time. Thank you, Kevin. And that wraps up the real estate portion of the afternoon. And to keep the afternoon going, I would first like to thank all of you for being here. And second, I would like to welcome back up on stage Jen to provide the opening remarks for our IoT portion. Thank you all. So will we see the video first? Well, Selection Day has been really exciting. I mean, the quality of the pitches has been top-notch. The technology that's being developed it looks like it could be quite impactful, and we're excited to be part of that company. Yes, it's been an honor to be here among all the other startups that are here today. Selection Day has been impressive. So this is my first Selection Day here in California. Not only just generally very well organized, which is super helpful, but just incredibly impressed with the, the depth and breadth of the number of, of corporate partners and the amount of support that's provided to the startup. From the moment you walk in the door, you feel kind of welcome and you, you, you have this sense of, of home. And I love that. As someone that's not from the area, it's really important to feel like that you're going to be looked after and, and you've got a place to call home. There are many corporate partners in the room today and to hear from them why, why they've sort of collaborated with Plug and Play, what they get out of it, and also to talk about the prospects of maybe engaging with them in the UK Mobility Innovation Hub as well. So it's been a really useful day so far. We've gone through the startup order barn over in Stuttgart with Plug and Play, and the traction points that we got from that was amazing relationships with some of the world's largest OEMs. Uh, for sure we wouldn't be talking to those guys if it wasn't for Plug and Play. I was part of this program initially, and this locally funded one, when I came at Plug and Play, and it benefited us so much. Seeing the companies that work here, seeing the startups, seeing the VCs, all the corporates that you met along the way, this comes nothing close to what Plug and Play have to offer. I think it's really important for corporations and startups to partner because the rate of change that we see today really just requires that we work together. We can't do it all alone and there's so much creativity. We need to come together and I think better future together.
私たちの,あの、まあ、JR 東日本という会社は特に大きなアセットを持っているのですが一方でそれをこう新しくこう違う分野で使うとかそういうところにちょっとあまり知見がないところがあるのでそういうところであのスタートアップの皆様の力を借りたいなと考えております。We introduce, first of all, new knowledge and, and new insights, but also we hope to uh, accelerate our innovation process. Working with Plug and Play gives us the, the opportunity to very efficiently look through those and catch those trends in、uh, technology and startup companies. And, and also, we get to meet many of them、uh, in person right here at Silicon Valley and also closely with other corporations who are the partners of Plug and Play. I think the fact it's so well established as well as a model, you know, when you talk to people who are in the, the game of innovation, Plug and Play is a well known, well respected, well trusted entity. And I think I couldn't think of a better partner really for, for us at this particular point in time on what we're trying to achieve. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to keep you awake for the last piece of the day. So, you have、um, to make a choice now. Either you get a coffee refill there or there,、um, or we do another clap exercise.、Um, sure. So, just get coffee、uh, if you like to refill a little bit or go for a bio break.、Um, but I'm going to give you a quick、uh, opening remarks for the IoT piece that's coming now. So, quick reminder. PMP Winter 2019 is our hashtag. Wi Fi, you should be on there with no password by now. So don't forget to use Line Upper for wo voting. That's important also for the IoT bit, and Brella for any kind of networking that you like to do. Quick look at the agenda.、Um, I'll be hosting you for the quick opening remarks right now. Then we'll see the startup pitches of our IoT badge、um, of the second half of the 2019 year. Then we、uh, have the People's Choice Awards ceremony and closing remarks before we finalize and round up this great expo week、um, with the last networking that we offer today on our second floor in the event、uh, space area where you are invited to join. Let's take a quick look at what we've achieved this year. So, 2019 and the numbers. Looks really great.、Um, we have introduced corporates to startups more than 700 times this year. We have hosted, after this week of Expo, way more than 100 deal flows、um, where we gave you the chance to interact with startups、uh, on a more in depth level. And we sourced、uh, another 2,200. IoT related startups into our database, into our ecosystem、um, to enable you and facilitate the work with the startups. We grew an extremely strong network of IoT partners here in Silicon Valley,、um, 34 strong partners in IoT, which I think is, is really a, a great number. And I, wanted, I would like to point out some of the ones that have just recently joined and like to invite them on stage. Um, I'd like to introduce、uh, one of our new anchor partners,、um, LG Electronics. They're, they're global innovator, LG, is actually joining forces with Plug and Play to, to nurture the, the positive impact on global communities by their really strong commitment to working with startups and,、um, and leveraging the ecosystem. We also share a mutual interest with them in, in building up the, the ecosystem between startups and、um, corporates in Korea. And we also host the internal LG MBA program together with our University 165、um, faculty members. So、uh, please welcome on stage the person who has been instrumental to push open innovation at LG, Yoon Tsu. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Yoon. I am in charge of、uh, LG Technology Center here in Silicon Valley.、Uh, LG is a very global and very complex organization. We have、uh, 60 major and small companies, and we are in three major fields electronics, chemical,、uh, and communication and services. Uh, and, uh, We are really happy to be here as an、uh, anchor partner. 
and uh, uh, you know, technology center's main role is to guide you through this very complex uh, organization to find the right partner. So uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you all today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, another one of our new partners, which is PFU, a Fujitsu company from Japan. Uh, PFU develops enterprise-rated hardware and software and service solutions, security solutions, and they joined us as a new anchor partner as well, and they're going to shape the IoT program with us. So welcome on stage, Kenjiro Tsurum. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kenji Tsurumi uh, with PFU America. And um, let's see what I was going to talk about, I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, PFU, um, PFU America is one of the 16 subsidiaries of uh, PFU Limited, which is incorporated in Japan as a wholly owned subsidiary of Fujitsu. And it was founded in 1960. And back then, the company was originally uh, founded as a computer manufacturer, a uh, computer company, and then an office computer back then. And the company has evolved the uh, last you know, several decades. And now uh, we, PFU, provide uh, uh, total IT solutions and services. In addition, uh, we, do, uh, we are the manufacturer and the distributor of uh, image, uh, document image scanners. Um, which holds the uh, number one uh, market share in the world. And also, uh, uh, we do uh, manufacture and uh, distribute uh, interactive kiosk terminals and embedded computer systems and uh, cybersecurity uh, systems uh, in Japan. And uh, we have a group of uh, innovation group uh, here in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, conveniently located pretty close to this uh, plug and play uh, in Sunnyvale. And uh, we also have an uh, office, uh, I mean, cubicle upstairs, uh, designated cubicle upstairs. So if you uh, are interested, uh, please feel free to stop by and have a chat. And we are very excited to join uh, plug and play uh, ecosystem. And we're looking forward to uh, working a lot of people here. And we're specifically uh, interested in the area of edge computing and AI technologies and augment the uh, reality and uh, virtual reality and what have you. So if we're in that area and if you're interested in pursuing opportunity or pursuing innovation with us, uh, please feel free to stop by. Uh, we're more than welcome to, more than happy to uh, discuss further with you. Thank you very much. All right, last but not least, I'd like to announce uh, another new partner that has joined, which is well, Claro Brazil. Um, they have joined us here in Silicon Valley after they became actually a founding partner of Plug and Play in Brazil. And their interests go way beyond IoT. This is why we're going to work with them also in the areas of food and materials. So please welcome on stage Diogo Natafi. Good afternoon, everyone. So sorry, uh, Diogo was not able to come. Uh, I'm Eduardo, I'm head of IoT of Claro. Uh, for you guys that don't know what Claro does, so we are part of America Mobile Group, the biggest uh, telecommunication group in Latin America. We have almost uh, 300 million customers uh, among uh, B2B, B2C, and also residential market. So uh, one of our, our uh, targets here Partnership with uh, the partnership with uh, uh, with plug and play sponsoring then in the first office in Brazil uh, is to of course make part of this uh, very big ecosystem that they have worldwide and uh, of course for us uh, which are looking for uh, startups uh, main, uh, mainly in uh, smart cities um, agriculture. Uh, healthcare and also in smart homes. So it is a pleasure to be with you here and um, feel free to contact us and if you have uh, some interesting um, solutions for these areas. Thanks a lot. All right. 
Now it's time to appreciate one of our partners that has shown actually a remarkable journey with us in the past month. I'm talking about our partner Kyocera. They have joined our ecosystem in 2015 and since then have been extremely active with us and have conducted uh, numerous PUC projects with um, our startups. And one of these projects, I was uh, happy to sit down with Muzib actually talk about that, was that Kiyosera uh, joined forces with LO3 Energy, one of our startup batches, to create the first ever virtual power plant in Japan. And with that, um, helped the success big time of Japan's goals to reduce um, CO2 emissions. So um, with that, we'd like to uh, honor Muzib Khan uh, and Kiyosera with an innovation award today. So welcome on stage. It's a great honor. Um, you know, I never thought that we will get this because Fujita-san and I, we struggle all day in our office trying to figure out why we are not more productive. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really an honor. And I, I thank uh, Plug and Play and also I thank all of you who have helped us get there. So as uh, Jennifer told you of our first success, which became a best of practices. Uh, we were very you know, honored on that one. But now that we have got this one, so we have something to go back to Japan and show. <laughs> so, so I want to share with you a few things here. You know, we are in the IoT group, but actually, Kyocera is a very diverse company. We have got areas of interest, many areas. Energy, telecom, health and medical, and automotive. So if you look at our proof of concept pilot that we have done this year alone, it's in about six or seven, and in all different areas. And we have got three or four, or even more, just in the process. So seven completed, three or four more in the process. We are really happy. But more so, we want to get your participation in working with us, because I think the things that we have learned over the last year and a half from you has tremendously inspired us, has tremendously inspired all our team in Japan. Believe me, before we were begging them to come here, now they're requesting us, how can we have a deal flow? So thanks for plug and play. We have been arranging deal flow very regularly. Not only that, we have also opened our office in uh, or we became a member of Plug and Play in Tokyo and became an anchor partner in Kyoto. So we hope that whatever we have achieved, next year we'll have a bigger plaque. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we need to work on a bigger award for next year then. Ho hopefully we can still carry it. <laughs> Okay, so before we take a look at the startup, before we call them on stage, I'd like to give you a quick industry update or a quick trend analysis that we have done um, over the course of the last half year. And I'd like to quickly start up um, with um, something that's been um, very present and that's actually, actually also been mentioned by PFU and one of their major interests. So I think this year's search for solutions been uh, mainly in the area of edge computing. Um, largely focusing on efficiency gains through artificial intelligence and, and machine learning um, to be run on edge devices. And therefore, we see a lot of traction um, in the creation of, for example, IoT data compression tools, edge cloud, or IoT system and middleware. So this is where we see really one of the, the, the major trends this year. Uh, also, since we have more and more uh, sensors and, and data transfer happening and sensors connected, IoT security is becoming uh, one of the major things that we need to look at. So clearly we see um, a lot of um, corporations or collaborations now taking place in, in topics of gateway security solution, encryption of transferred data, and even proactive threat detection. Well, computer vision has always been a great thing, especially in industrial IoT, because we needed to to uh, not only reduce costs, but to like 
avoid errors or re uh, mitigate risks and things like that. So we've seen a lot of traction this year uh, with computer vision in, in, in quality assurance and manufacturing processes and optimizing and uh, ensuring monitoring workplace safety, even identifying counterfeit components and um, other uh, manual um, maintenance and repair and manual intensive uh, work that we can reduce with that. Well, talking about industrial IoT, artificial intelligence and machine learning is still very important in that field. So what we've seen this year a lot is um, looking further into predictive maintenance and AI for operation optimization, which is um, very important in all the manufacturing processes. And, and I guess you know that because it's mostly the field that you're working in. And when we talk about AI, what we really need for this is really efficient AI platforms. So um, while we see it's difficult and it's very costly to maintain and monitor and not only to build these AI platforms, we see there's a lot of traction in supervised and unsupervised and semi-supervised AI platforms, uh, model monitoring and even the automation of that and the synthetic data generation platforms. So to quickly conclude of the trends that we see this year, it's, we see a lot of new opportunities actually coming up or remaining available, let me say it this way, because some of the problems really remain unsolved. So um, this is again an invitation to look into these topics and find the solutions that we need because there's still a lot of opportunities in the creation of value-driven business models. And we see as well that a lot of these IoT technologies that are usually used in industrial setup are now being rolled out in the context of smart cities. So um, the application of AI, machine learning, and um, computer vision applications will become more and more important in, in the smart spaces and smart city solutions. But winning in the space requires more collaboration. So again, use plug and play more to, to get together with the relevant stakeholders and collaborate on, uh, on these topics. Uh, and to really work on convincing technologies um, so that not only the organizations but also the cities of the futures will adopt these. All right, so I would like to thank you for your time and I'd like to welcome our MC on stage for the rest of the afternoon, my dear colleague, Edison Honeycutt. Hi guys, welcome. Thank you for sticking out to the very end. We know we've saved the best for last for you here with IoT. Um, and I am just gonna get straight into the startup presentations. Um, but we're starting off on a great foot because our first presenter actually created a set of IoT courses for Northeastern University. So hopefully he can teach us all a little something today. Please give a warm welcome to Kilton from Edgeworks. We need the clicker. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying around for this portion. So my name is Kilton, and I'm with a company called Edgeworks. So what's Edgeworks all about? Enterprise-scale edge computing. You've probably heard about edge computing. So what's the vision behind it? Well, we all know what cloud is at this point. We all know what big data is at this point. Edge computing is the next mega trend that's going to be on everyone's lips in another five years, but you need it right now. And what it's all about is unlocking the power of the compute that exists in the physical world to make it run like it does in the cloud. So who is involved? The important thing to note here is we have a technologist, which is me. We have a product person who has done this before. This man actually was one of the architects of Hadoop. And then we have a, a market and, and finance genius. So what I'm saying here is, we think we have a pretty good handle on what edge computing is, so go ahead and ask us. So let's skip ahead to what's going on in the market that makes edge computing so attractive. In the near future, the vast majority of data is not going to be generated in cloud and data center. It's going to be generated from outside, things like vehicles, smart homes, and uh, fully online manufacturing systems. And you're gonna need to be able to handle that the way that you handle data in the cloud and data center. So where do we fit? So Edgeworks is next to your IoT technologies, running on whatever infrastructure you want, enabling edge applications. And so what you have is a set of technologies that make the edge look and run just like the cloud. 
and it integrates with all of your cloud systems, such as Kubernetes. So how you operate your current cloud is how you now can operate your edge. And there's this thing called EdgeOps now. Just like DevOps, EdgeOps is how you build and deploy software to the edge. We make that happen. So how do we work as a company? We have an open source technology called Eclipse IOFog. This is used by tens of thousands of customers and companies across the globe and is contributed to by over a dozen companies at this point. Companies that you'll hear announced next week, uh, you know, some chip companies and some larger players that I can't reveal at the moment. We put that technology out there so that the world can build with it, building our ecosystem. And eventually then, as a company, we also have commercial offerings that sit on top of it. So where we make our money as a company is things that are, are built on top of the open source, and this model has been proven time and time again to scale very well commercially. And so Edgeworks is all about open source, enterprise scale edge computing technology. And on top of that, we build a suite of products for our enterprise customers, and we are currently fundraising and always accepting new users and customers. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, we are going to stay on the edge, but move to some of the enabling hardware. Here to tell you more about the AI chipsets is Mark from Gear Falcon. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, just wanted to point out that Jen, during the introduction, was talking about the challenges of edge AI as consisting of computation power, cost, data issues, and challenges. And our, my presentation is going to address a lot of those issues. If you want more details, we can talk during the networking break. So Gear Falcon technology is a scale up. We were founded in 2017 in Milpitas here in Silicon Valley. And we have since expanded uh, with five offices in Asia, Japan, Korea, and uh, China. We have 34 patents awarded to date, uh, which is a protection on our unique technology. Um, and you know our talent pool consists of AI and semiconductor experts. We've been recognized so far in Forbes, EE Times, Gartner, Frost and Sullivan, and many other publications and analyst reviews. And we have great partners. LG is one of our great partners, uh, along with many others. And they are using our chips. We, uh, we have four chips in production. They are using that to create AI solutions from the edge, IoT endpoints, all the way to advanced edge and into the cloud, data center solutions. And they do, uh, all of our chips share the same architecture. It's the MPE, it's uh, AI processing in memory, which allows us to do very fast processing and reduce the amount of energy consumed with high precision. We use CNN to deliver the edge AI uh, uh, applications. And we can use audio, visual, and sensor inputs. And what I'm showing here is the Lightspear 5801S. It's uh, our fourth chip. It's an ASIC. And uh, it delivers 2.8 tops. That's trillion operations per second. We do that with very low energy. So that's how we can provide the industry's leading edge AI ratio of performance to power. And we do that at low cost and a small size. And one of the key advantages we provide to our customers is they don't have to use a premium SOC to have AI on their device. They can use a more modestly uh, featured uh, host processor and pair that with our AI accelerator chip and reduce their bomb cost and still deliver state-of-the-art um, high-performance AI in their applications. And the Q70 here from LG was launched and announced in October, and that has leading-edge AI capabilities, they deliver the same types of uh, photographic and uh, video processing capabilities as a uh, iPhone 11 or uh, the, the most expensive uh, Galaxy Samsung phone. Uh, and that's a very modestly priced uh, device. And we're really excited about the future of AI, which is using video coded for machines at the edge. Talk to me during the break. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, our next startup is working to empower machines to understand and explain what they see. Please welcome Adam from Shapes AI. Good afternoon. Shapes AI is enabling machines to reason about what they see. Today I'm going to talk about driving in California, the current problems with it, and how Shapes AI can help. In California in 2017, there were nearly half a million car crashes, over a quarter of a million injuries, and nearly 4,000 deaths. This is despite over 100 sensors being deployed in cars and countless more around our cities and freeways. Computer vision can help, but it's flawed. Most computer vision systems are very good about understanding what's in a scene, but very poor at understanding what's happening within that scene. This is because they rely on picking out statistical patterns and data, and this just isn't sophisticated enough to determine and understand what certain events and actions are. This also means the systems are very, very data hungry, making develop developing them time consuming and expensive. This is why we built deep visual reasoning. Deep visual reasoning reasons over visual data to infer and flag situations of interest, giving us more actionable insights. Our system is fully explainable and interpretable to humans so you can understand exactly why decisions are being made. No more black box AI. It's very simple to set up. We require a fraction of the training data normally required, typically one to two percent. This is why we can reason over just about any type of event. Here it is inferring traffic hazards, here parking congestion. I can show you more of these demos uh, up, upstairs. And we've also demoed and tested on other behaviors like violence, theft, industrial hazards, meaning we've, we're building a cross-sector platform that can attack industries such as autonomous driving, smart cities, security, construction, and much more. You can uh, connect and it works with all kinds of sensors and deployable by all the three main methods, cloud, edge, and on-premise. Uh, we're engaged with some of the biggest names now um, on, on projects and to deliver on them as a truly world-class team, hailing from the likes of the University of Cambridge, uh, PhDs in machine learning, computer vision, uh, and worked for the likes of Microsoft Research, Apple, Amazon, uh, and a few more. Uh, supported by a very distinguished advisory board. These are some of the leading professors, researchers, and uh, strategists in AI. So to recap, deep visual reasoning. We extract more actionable insights from visual data by understanding exact situations and events happening. All our decisions, all the AI uh, inferences are fully explainable and interpreted to humans. And we can set up a solution very simply, very quickly, and very cost efficiently because of a, need, a lack of need for training data. Thank you very much. OK, our next presenter could ride a bike at two years old. Let's see what he can do at the ripe old age of 22. Um, please welcome Paul from NeuroAI. Hi, so I'm Paul, the CEO and co-founder of NeuroAI. And at NeuroAI, our intention is to be the one-stop shop for AI computing. And what I mean by this is by providing scalable architecture that sits both in the cloud and enterprise use, but also for edge inference and training as well. So we've heard uh, today a lot of data is going to be very available directly on the edge. So we're also uh, supporting training directly on the edge for trickle training, um, as we, we call it. So really, the reason why this company was founded was because myself and my co-founder, we were working in AI research and in the automotive industry as well. And our systems were incredibly slow, the more complex that we made them. So we would go and try and spec support for other hardware solutions out there, and there were none really that anyone used. And the major issue behind that was the fact that they're incredibly complicated to use and took a huge amount of development. And on top of that, because the AI world is moving along so fast, it means that they very rarely support new models 
and actually accelerate them down the line. So our solution to this is to create fast, affordable, and general purpose hardware. Uh, and really, our key driver behind what we're producing is ease of use for the user. And on top of that, which really builds into that, is the fact that we have reconfigurable hardware. So actually, as artificial intelligence changes out there in the world, we can actually directly upgrade our hardware solution to support acceleration for that. So our products, I have here our development card uh, today, um, which you can come and see after if you'd like. Uh, we just finished going through manufacturing. Um, so you can see here this model is actually the same one that Steve Jobs used at Apple when he came back and brought it back. So there are four target areas that we're going to be working with. So lightweight compute sticks, a performance edge card, and then a performance local card, typically used by researchers and companies that need to be GDPR compliant. And on top of that, we're going to be offering uh, enterprise cards, which are much more high performance, and we're going to be offering a hardware as a service model for that. And all of these are built on one scalable chip architecture and one software package. So if you want to train in the cloud and then move it directly to the edge, you do it, and you don't have to change the code at all. So the market potential in this space is absolutely huge, as everyone knows. AI is increasingly in demand right through all industries. So how we're going to tackle this is by offering great performance metrics over a card such as the V100, which is the best, um, one of the best cards produced by NVIDIA for enterprise use. And uh, what our card will be performing down the line is 3.5 to 5 times performance based on the architecture uh, that we've spec so far. In addition to this, because we're a lot more specific for AI, it means that we can reduce the energy consumption of the device. So it will be operating at around 50 to 70 watts. So the competition, typically people use GPUs, but again, these were not made for processing artificial intelligence. So they're incredibly power hungry and slow. There are companies out there producing AI solutions, but no one uses them. People still go to NVIDIA because, again, they're not being up to date. They tend to be very specific for one form of AI or another, video processing or natural language processing, such as GraphCore. But if you have a different requirement, then there's not something for you, or if your needs change. So we founded early on in, in this year, and we closed our first round of funding just before we graduated university. And now we're looking to close our second round of funding with our commercialization and trials happening in the coming year. This is our core team. Uh, there's three of us. There's also uh, six people in our office in total, with two more starting in January. Thank you very much. And if you're interested, come talk to us after. Thank you. Okay, our next startup derives their name from the Japanese word for road. And they're currently sitting at the crossroads of AI, enabling the next generation of computer vision. Please welcome Nitin from Dory. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nitin Gupta. I'm uh, the VP of product and co-founder at Dory. And I wanted to talk to you about our vision at Dory. We really started this company with the vision of accelerating the development of AI computer vision applications. If you look at the way deep learning has evolved over the last few years, a few, ends, a few trends are evident. We've seen a maturity in the tools and frameworks that are made available, and it's led to a high level of model accuracy, which has opened the door to millions of computer vision use cases to actually be built. Now, imagine you wanted to build a simple helmet or safety application using computer vision. What would you need to consider? The answer is a lot. The first pro part of that process is data collection. Generally, your data needs to be private, and you need to customize that application for any use case. You may be dealing with thousands of hours of footage coming from multiple camera feeds, and you need to worry about things like lighting conditions, perspective, different poses from different uh, angles, and all of that is even before you even start building the model itself. And once you get to the model building process, there, be, there may be multiple data sets and models that you need to try out to see what's the right combination to figure out what level of accuracy you need. And when you deploy that on the edge or on the cloud, you're going to have to deal with upgrades and how do you collect new data from the field. And so as you can see, building these computer vision applications is a challenge. You need to acquire quality data, which currently, if you're trying to annotate that, can be very time consuming and costly. 
And most developers are not data scientists, and so acquiring that talent can be very challenging. And just building a computer vision application is not just a model. There's a whole lot of software that's uh, needed around the model, which could take anywhere from nine to 12 months with a team of engineers. And if you look at the solutions that are available today, they're just not built for enterprise. Enterprises need tailored and custom solutions, and they need unified and automated workflows that enable you to rapidly create these applications. And lastly, you need that privacy and security to ensure that your data and your IP is not being leaked. So Dory solves these challenges by being the first end-to-end -end computer vision application development platform that brings together all of these components into one unified environment. It's usable, it's customizable, it's scalable. We enable robust data set creation by enabling techniques like GAN and synthetic generation through it within the platform. You can rapidly build applications by training, tuning, benchmarking, and deploying all of your models on any cloud, edge, or hybrid platform. And we enable that active learning lifecycle, which allows you to detect anomalies or drifts within your models and your data sets so that you can automatically feed that back to your retraining or re-annotation. And so to summarize, Dory is gonna become the category leader in a multi-billion dollar computer vision market. We've put together an experienced team. We've got a scalable product that the enterprise needs today. And we're at the cusp of an exploding market and it's primed and ready. We look forward to speaking with you further and we hope you'll join us on this journey. Thank you. Our next founder's last startup was in ad tech and he traveled all over Asia for it. Um, but here to tell us about his current venture is Tomer from Concertium. Hello everyone, I'm Tomer, co-founder and CEO of Concertio. And I want you to imagine for a moment as a telecom company with a, a large computing infrastructure or as a user of such infrastructure, what would be the implications if you would have had 25% more performance in your existing infrastructure? So the first thing that would happen, you would be more productive because your job will finish 20% sooner and latencies will be cut by 20%. And the second thing that will happen is that you will be able to perform the same workload but with 20% less compute. This means 20% cut in your infrastructure bill. And what if I told you this could be possible today in your infrastructure in a very straightforward manner? Well, the thing is that computing systems are very complex and they have many tunable settings. You can find them in the BIOS, you can find them in the processors, in the firmware, in the application frameworks, in the operating systems, the applications themselves, even in the choice of compiler flags that you use to compile your binaries. Now, the idea is that if you tailor all of these hundreds of settings to whatever you're running, to your workload, you get significantly higher performance. Now, that used to be easy when there were only a handful of settings that performance engineer would spend a few hours, try a few combinations, and get you good performance. But those days are gone because today we are already in the hundreds of settings and they depend on each other. So the number of possibilities to configure a system today can reach 10 to the power of 40. Obviously not something you can do manually. And this is what we do. We automate the process of performance tuning using machine learning techniques in order for our customers to get better performance and reduce the cost. So if you're asking yourselves one of these questions, uh, we can help. For example, why are we spending so much on infrastructure? Are we overspending? Can we give new life and capabilities to IoT devices or, for example, home routers? Do we need to replace all of them the moment that we need more performance and they cannot support it? How can we reliably compare between hardware and software vendors and products? Obviously, you want to compare between tuned products and not untuned products to have smart purchasing decisions. Can we improve the operating margin if IT is one of our biggest expenses? And how can we choose the infrastructure when we migrate our workloads to the cloud? And so on and so on. We basically put the infrastructure on overdrive. So whatever the application, you can see here a few examples of uh, speed ups that can be achieved using uh, uh, our tools like Kubernetes, Hadoop, uh, a bunch of databases. And um, 
I welcome you to speak with me after the presentation, find out how companies like Intel, like Marvel, and like Mellanox are applying uh, our tools, machine learning techniques to optimize their products and their infrastructure and cut costs. So thank you very much. Okay, our next presenter has been trying to save the world since 2012. Please give a warm welcome to Michael from Clean Air. Hello. So, of the 25 most polluted cities in the United States, 12 of them are here in California. Along with that, the EPA estimates that indoor air quality is up to five times worse than the air outdoors. So what do we do when we can't open a window for fresh air anymore? Unfortunately, HEPA filters are not a sustainable solution. They're highly restrictive to airflow and increase health household energy costs. Standard filters haven't been innovated in decades and fail to capture VOCs. And portable solutions only work on a room-to-room -room basis and could cost upwards of $1,000 per unit. So how do we save the world from poor indoor air quality? Meet Alvi. Alvi is the next generation of furnace filter and your home's virtual air assistant. Alvi provides HEPA class air quality, lowers building energy consumption, and provides data and alerts on indoor air quality and filter performance via smartphone or building automation system. Now, the magic of Alvi is that we use active polarization, so we don't have to utilize highly restrictive filter media to capture a high level of particulate. And as you can see here, Alvi is combining the particles together and providing your home with clean air. So 3M has just released their version of a smart filter and has indicated to us that our market timing is bang on. As they've uh, focused on the disposable market, Alvi is a truly smart home device. And as you can see from the slide, Alvi outperforms 3M's filtrate filter in literally every category. Now Alvi, uh, the beauty of Alvi is that she fits all furnace filters. Literally wherever there is a furnace filter installed, Alvi's technology platform can be applied. Uh, it's a one-time device cost right now of 229, and the filter media uh, uh, retails right now for about $29 uh, US. Our model so far has been to go after, or sorry, B to B to C. We've been going after property management companies, real estate developers, and REITs, uh, with the end consumer, uh, sorry, with the homeowner being the end consumer. Now, the TAM for Alvi is huge. It's 9.1 billion in North America, and this is only factoring in the residential filter market. What we've seen is both uh, heavy growth in both the IoT sector and uh, the HVAC market. And at the intersection of this growth, presents an exciting market opportunity for Alvi. This is a snapshot of just our progress so far. Our end of year goals are 500 homes and to land a deal with a major property management company or real estate developer. Here's a snapshot of a few of our revenue projections over the next five years. And as Alvi is kindly displaying, uh, the lifetime value of an Alvi user is uh, $1,100. At CleanArt.ai, we are a team of air filtration experts and engineers who are motivated to help the world breathe easier. Some of our traction to date is we've recently filed our PCT, we raised $50,000 in pre-sales, and we're in late stage conversation with a major real estate developer about making Alvi a standard offering in the home. Uh, we are opening up a seed round and are looking to speak with any interested parties about how we can disrupt the air filtration industry together. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. We are right at the halfway mark, so I wanted to give everyone a reminder to use the QR code on the back of your name tag to vote for your favorite startup you see today. Um, starting the second half off, we actually have um, Carol, who was the first African-American woman to get a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT. She's here to today to tell us about OmniSpeech.
Okay, hello everyone. I am Dr. Carol S. B. Wilson, the founder and CTO of OmniSpeech, a speech processing software company that develops technology so you can understand speech better. We have developed unique technology that combines deep learning and traditional signal processing to extract speech specific information to improve voice quality. Our vision is to be in every phone, every hearing aid, every car, and every computer in the world. Speech is everywhere, but so is noise. We now have apps that bring us food. We have apps that take us to the airport. We even have apps to express emotions. But speech is still the killer app. We not only use speech to communicate with each other, we're now controlling smart devices with speech, whether that's our car or a thermostat. Our technology is device and platform independent. It can be on a chip, it can be on a laptop, it can be out in the cloud. So let's hear how we perform. Hi, sorry I'm running late for dinner. As you can hear, I'm stuck in traffic. Oh, you can't hear me? How about now? I just turned OmniClear on. I'll be at the restaurant 45 minutes. We will be in headsets and in phones. We plan to be in smart devices and even hearing aids. We have been on sophisticated chips, such as in smartphones, and we have been on very small chips, such as in earphones. So we have a lot of experience porting to these different platforms. Our business model is a royalty per device or per user. There are billions of devices sold every year that use speech, and the replacement cycle for these uh, devices is very attractive, creating a huge opportunity for us. This, this uh, technology is based on decades of my research at MIT and at the University of Maryland. We will be getting our 10th patent this month. Our technology is complete, it's in the market, and we have a pipeline for devices starting in January 2020 that include a wired and wireless headset, a mid-tier phone being sold in the emerging markets, and a secure IoT network. We have been offered a strategic partnership with a company that also wants us in several of their products, and they've offered to be the leading investor uh, in our Series A round given us a million dollars. So we're seeking $3 million so we can build our business team, our sales and marketing staff, staff so that we can grow and scale our business. I am supported by a world-class team that includes experienced business executives and really smart PhD level engineers. Thank you. And I hope that you'll come and visit with us to learn more about OmniSpeech and our team on the second floor after this session. All right, our next CEO was the first woman to earn tenure in mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley. Um, please welcome Alice and her chief operating officer, Denise, from Squishy Robotics. So I'm CEO of Squishy Robotics, Alice Agagino. We provide life-saving, cost-saving information in real time through our rapidly deployable mobile sensor robots. And I'm right in front of you, aren't I? Um, this is our leadership team. I'm a professor at a mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley in addition to being CEO. I started the first integrated AI hardware lab on the UC Berkeley campus and have worked on a wide range of applications. Our leadership team here has deep knowledge about artificial intelligence, robotics, sensor fusion, data analytic, and product design. And Denise is our chief operating officer joining me here today. This is a typical use case. This derailment of a chlorine tanker happened in the dead of night in South Carolina. The firefighters that went in to the hazardous material situation no, had no idea what they were walking into. And as a result, because of poor situation awareness, there were nine deaths and over 600 injuries. 
this could have been handled by squishy robotics if we had been rapidly deployed in order to provide intelligence to the first responders to protect themselves and the local community. This is how squishy robotics comes to the rescue. We are impact resistant, as Denise will demonstrate. We have dropped uh, from helicopters, from drones, from fixed wing aircraft. We've dropped as much as 1,000 feet, which is 300 meters. We collect data as we go down and we survive and continue to transmit data when we land. Each robot is equipped in the center with a customizable module of sensors. There are six ca uh, cameras on board so that we have 360 degree vision and we also have telecommunication capabilities on board as well. We have our success and some of our achievements have received great press and we've been able to use that press to help us with our customer development. We're working with the largest and most influential fire departments in the country. We are also working as an example here, we've been to Houston working with the petrochemical companies. Houston is the petrochemical center of the United States and we work with not only the companies, the uh, petrochemical companies on the industrial internet of things, but also with the local firefighters that have to work in this hazardous area. Uh, this is our product platform. On the right, you see the stationary robot that Denise is holding now. This robot is being tested in the field right now. In the middle is our mobile robot that will be able to drop and move as a, a mobility robot. It is being tested in the lab. And then we have a trajectory where we're putting rotors on the robot so that we have aerial ground hybrid mobility, as you see on the right, and also we would have a floating robot. We also have an architecture for distributed computing. We start with edge computing both on the robot and then the local decision makers have computers or handheld devices. We take advantage of local sensors that are in the area and we also have the ability to create a mesh network. Over time, as we add more data to the cloud, we'll be able to improve our data analytics over time uh, with machine learning. So we'll see if this works. It's supposed to be a video of one of the demonstrations that we've done with the LA County Fire Department. They have a hazardous material and disaster response area where they test different technologies. You see squishy robotic being brought in by a drone and being dropped in a location where a truck is overturned on the freeway and noxious chemicals are coming out of it. Squishy Robotics provides life-saving, cost-saving information in real time. So we do have a round that we're going, a seed round of funding. We're very interested in that, interested in customers and in strategic partnerships. Thank you. Our next presenter once set the world record for Brick Breaker on the BlackBerry. Now he's applying that same level of intense focus to optimizing operations. Please welcome Joe from Optio3. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start by applauding Plug and Play for pulling together energy, uh, real estate, uh, mobility, and IoT. I think that's a terrific idea, and it's one that's very consistent with our experience in the market. So congratulations for doing that. Optio3, so what do we do? We unlock IoT data to help operationalize enterprise workflows and to accelerate digital transformation. Essentially, we're helping customers build billion dollar businesses in internet and IoT. So what's the problem that we're solving? Unlocking and operationalizing this data is difficult. It's expensive. There's a lot of opportunity cost for failure um, and it takes time. So we solve that problem, but we're also helping accelerate the digital transformation journey for our customers. So this is supposed to be an animation. So you can't see any of this. Just imagine you're a customer over here. On the left, you have a vendor A. They're deploying an edge gateway device. They have a data plan in a cloud. Eventually, you get a dashboard. No big problem. At the divisional level, you might have two or three of those vendors. But across a corporation with five or six business units, you could have dozens. The problem is you have an enormous amount of redundant infrastructure and silos of data and re redundant expenses as well. Imagine a world where you have all those same vendors, but you have the ability through a universal edge device to be able to pull the data directly from the sensors, to be able to put it into a single cloud, all synchronized data, one login, one dashboard, no islands of data, and to be able to make that operationally useful. This is what we do at scale today for our customers. And what they get out of it from this horizontal platform 
is the ability to look at their portfolio, operational level views, maintenance level views, fuel, energy savings, whole alerting and notification workflow streams, significant amount of value in one horizontal platform. I hope that makes sense because we have a hard time explaining what we do without going into that level of detail. We have paying customers, big paying customers, and we're helping them save money and improve efficiency and the availability of assets every single day. We're signing new customers at the rate of two to three a month right now. The size of our deals run from six figures in almost all cases to seven figure deals and they're all annual subscription based revenue streams. Uh, you're hearing today for the first time that we're just about to sign a significant collaboration agreement with Microsoft and their Azure Automotive Group. So this is going to be a significant accelerator for us next year. Here's an example of what we do in commercial real estate. Siemens has a customer, CBRE. CBRE manages property. In this case, it's a building that Amazon's going to occupy. They've got over 60,000 sensors in that building. Within two weeks, we brought all those sensors, reporting, uh, classified them, and showed Siemens how to double the value of their contract with CBRE and how CBRE could get a 200% ROI as a result of the data that we showed them. In commercial transportation, we work with Palfinger, the number one liftgate manufacturer in the world. They work with CNS Wholesale Grocers, the largest wholesale grocer in the United States. What their challenges are is to make sure those assets are highly available, that those liftgate batteries never go dead, and that the customers that they serve are getting exactly what they signed up for. Rounding out, this is the end. Differentiators. What makes us special? We're fast. Our ROIs, we've never delivered less than a 200% ROI to our customers. Um, our time to value is measured in weeks, not months, typically less than two weeks, sometimes as few as two to three hours. We have a no-touch application. It's all over-the-air updated, so we can do firmware updates remotely. Nobody's ever going to touch a sensor when it goes into an environment. Hyperscale, we're all about billions and more than billions. We have one single building that's got over 455,000 sensors reporting every 15 minutes. That's the kind of scale that we're used to operating at. We're unlocking and making things actionable. That's the critical differentiator in our business. And we're also extremely flexible. I said it's a horizontal platform. We can talk to any sensor through any protocol. It could be our edge gateway device or somebody else's edge gateway device. We're already across commercial real estate, transportation, uh, nanogrids, microgrids, and remote electrification. We're being drawn into things like oil and natural gas. And we invite you to help us accelerate your billion dollar connected business. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter, besides being a CEO and professor, also recently hiked the Inca Trail. Please give a warm welcome to Eric from Lincode Labs. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Plug and Play and everyone uh, part of the community here today. So my name is Eric Malice, and I am a co-founder of Lincode. Lincode is an AI and computer vision company that helps manufacturing companies identify, predict, and eliminate product defects throughout the manufacturing process from receiving to production, assembly, and packaging. My co-founder and our CEO, Rajesh Iyengar, has had three previous exits in manufacturing technology companies. Our CTO, Ritika Nigam, has almost a decade experience in senior technology roles at companies like Microsoft, and ADP. And I am our CMO, and I have over 10 years' experience in strategy, business development, marketing, and law. We also have a full team of advisors with deep experience in automation and machine learning. So what's the challenge? Today in manufacturing, despite the rise of smart factory technologies over the last 10 years, quality management remains the number one issue when it comes to increasing efficiency on the factory floor. Quality inspection today either relies on manual inspectors, where there's issues of human error and volume limitations, as well as potential shortages in skilled labor, especially as we go into the future. And then other machine vision systems, while they've increased automation, uh, they often have limited function or specializations that require several different pieces of equipment, which can be expensive. There are complex hardware integrations and often long deployment cycles. 
The impact of this is that a lot of companies are experiencing significant material and labor losses and expenses, um, which can be in some cases as high as 15% of operational expenses, not to mention loss of yield and potential revenue. So we are a software company that helps manufacturers identify objects, text, dimensions, colors, and defects. We enable you to visually inspect every product in the manufacturing process, identify defects in real time, and then predict and eliminate defects, all without any major changes to your current manufacturing structure. So imagine there's parts moving on a conveyor, and we take a quick image capture as they go by to identify defects as small as two microns in size while moving on that conveyor. The dashboard allows the operator to observe the products and get a count of how many are accepted and rejected, as well as other data, and connect with other sensors. The system itself can be accessible uh, by management anywhere in the world. We can connect with robotic arms to then tell the factory what to do based on the, the data as we acquire it. In a unique way, we have two of many uh, distinct value propositions, one of which is that because of the proprietary nature of our patent pending software, we've developed the ability to train models based on limited data sets, which allow for faster deployments, and get higher accuracy and reliability in open settings. Primarily, we focus on automotive and electronics customers, and we have a number of customers around the world. And I'm here today because we're looking for additional introductions to customers and strategic partners to help us expand. We're also holding a small pre-seed round, and if anyone is interested in speaking to me, I will be upstairs after this event. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next startup is working to help factories solve the problem of predictive maintenance. Please welcome Vlad from Conundrum. Thank you guys for having me. Actually, I have only five slides, so it would be very quick. So uh, Conundrum is, that's an old presentation. Well, anyway, Conundrum is a UK-based company which provides artificial intelligence for uh, such industries as metal mining, oil and gas, um, and chemical. Um, right now we have, uh, in the last few years, we've made mo more than 30 successful pilots um, for such applications as predictive maintenance, quality control, quality optimization, and anomaly detection. Uh, right now, we have more than 25 people in our company, uh, and we are um, actually, mo most of them are data scientists, and including myself. So we have uh, very uh, amazing partners, such as McKinsey, um, NVIDIA, and Hitachi, who help us to create real AI solution for uh, diff different uh, clients. Um, yeah, that's that's my presentation. Great. So um, we providing uh, AI solution, which with benefits, uh, we have three main advantages over uh, classical approach. Well, first of all, we are uh, providing automated AI, which means that you just push the button and um, you know you receive solution. Uh, secondly, uh, we um, all our solutions are product ready, which means that you don't spend any time from uh, pilot to uh, production stage. And I think the most important one uh, advantage that we, um, it's all our solutions are self-adaptive, which means that with our license, we cover any type of changes in your factory from sensor changing up to environmental changing or you know, maybe you have new products on, on your line. So uh, deployment process is very easy, and it uh, requires only f uh, three steps, um, and usually we spend from two to uh, three months. Uh, so first st uh, stage, uh, first step, it's uh, proof of concept, and it only requ require um, just historical data. Um, second stage, it's uh, pilot on uh, real-time data, and the last stage is uh, production stage, uh, where we operate um, our models in there. So we provide um, both in-cloud and on-prem solution, which 
you know, uh, help us to be very flexible for any type of customers. And last slide that we are um, actually, you could connect Conundrum solution to any type of industrial system, um, including SCADA system, a mess system, uh, historian uh, data, so we are very flexible on that. Um, yeah, I have some slides about experience, but I have no time left. Thank you for your attention. Our next presenter was featured on the Forbes 30 Under 30 for his contributions to advanced manufacturing. Let's all give a warm welcome to Jeff from Fabricate. Thank you. I'm Jeff Herman, CEO of Fabricate Labs. Uh, and we're working to uh, build a new approach to add metal added manufacturing. If you're familiar with the space at all today, you're using a high powered laser to fuse metal powder together, or using glue to bind that powder together and then stick it in the oven to create your part. Unfortunately, both these methods are very expensive uh, to deploy, bringing your part costs very high to the point where the technology can really only be used for prototyping. And instead, we've developed a new approach that uses electrochemical deposition. So instead of using metal powders, we use an electroplating bath. Uh, and this is in how our implementation works. The key innovation is traditionally, uh, when you do electrochemical deposition, you have to use a photolithography mass to shape each layer. Instead, we've developed a process that's built on TFT technology, the same thing that's in your phone or computer monitor. And this allows us to dynamically shape the anode to whatever pattern we need for a particular layer. And what this allows us to do is take the benefits of an electrochemical process where parts are built at the atomic level and scale it to the point where we can start addressing low to medium volume manufacturing. Uh, so this is how this technology scales. We go from where we are today with our Gen 1 demonstrator. It's a very small build area, 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters. But this technology, because it's built on the same thing that goes into your TV or phone screen, we can scale this build volume very rapidly to our Gen 2 and Gen 2 3 systems, which allow us to address medium to low volume manufacturing. And this is critical because the technologies that are in the market today are very limited to prototyping. The very high cost of the powder, the lasers, the vacuum chambers, all lead to a technology that doesn't scale to larger volumes where our technology, utilizing TFT technology, uh, allows parts to be built at a much lower cost than the other technologies in the market. So where we're at today is we've developed our Gen 1 system that demonstrates the part quality and the capabilities of our printing system. We've partnered with key vendors to scale from our demonstrator to our production models. Uh, we've va validated the market opportunity with key partners like Merck, Stanley Black & Decker, uh, and other uh, key uh, verticals. We've demonstrated different alloys, so we can do copper, nickel alloys, tungsten alloys, a number of different materials that are important to our customers. We've secured patents on the core IP to give us room to navigate and bring this technology to market. And we've assembled a team of experienced professionals that cover all the engineering disciplines that are required. So how we got here, we've been working on this for now almost four years. Uh, we closed a seed round uh, about 18 months ago and we're in the process of closing our Series A. We've been able to get over seven million of the 12 million round we're, we're looking to raise. Uh, and this factors into the team we have on our, our board. So myself, CEO, my partner, David Payne, and our uh, principal scientist, as well as our board that interfaces with both IMEC and Stanley, two of our important partners, as well as some of the industry experts that have deployed this technology in the past. So our investors, Stanley uh, Ventures and IMEC led our seed round and continue to be important partners. Mark Cuban was our first investor and helped bring this technology from a, a paper stage to a demonstrator. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, I've got a number of parts to show the technology and uh, share a little bit more about where we're going. Thank you. All right, everyone, last but not least, our final startup comes from Japan, but the presenter clearly doesn't. Please welcome Adrian from Hackress. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Plug and Play, for hosting us. Uh, I'll promise I'll be brief. I hate to stand in the way of beers and food and all the fun upstairs. So um, we are hackers, and we make lightweight and explainable AI tools. Uh, very briefly about us as a company, uh, we are founded in 2014, uh, headquartered in Kyoto. Uh, today, we're around 50 people. Uh, we raised a Series A round of 3.7 million US dollars. Uh, the team is international, but primarily Japanese. Um, our lead investor is Miyako Capital, so we are a bit of a Kyoto University spin-off, as well as medical and manufacturing companies. It's good to see and be a representative of the Japanese startup scene with so many Japanese corporate partners. Uh, what we're doing is, is we're tackling a problem that's facing Japan today, but the rest of the developed world tomorrow, an aging population. An aging population has two serious consequences. One is that there are less people left to do the work to support the aging population, and the other is a bigger strain on the medical system. So we need to find ways to be more efficient and more productive. At Hackers, we believe it's precision tools based on AI technology. Our value proposition is tied around providing explainable AI that is energy and resource efficient and works with small data sets. We produce this uh, through uh, a group of expert machine learning and data scientists, and we're focusing on two fields. Uh, on one hand, the medical industry, on the other hand, Industry 4.0 applications. In medical industry, we do things like help doctors detect and classify brain strokes from MRI scans. In Industry 4.0, we help semiconductor manufacturers with things like detecting and classifying soldering mistakes. Our core technology is based around something called sparse modeling. We're working closely with our partners at Kyoto, Tohoku, and Shiga University. We have patents in Japan for this technology. Some recent announcements that I'm happy to share with you that's been during the past three months in this program. Uh, we've joined the uh, elec Mitsubishi Electric Accelerator Program in Nagoya, and that's in its final stages right now. Uh, we've also joined the Digital Health Partnership Program with Bayer in Kobe, in the life science city. In terms of traction, we work primarily with Japanese customers, and one of the objectives with coming here to play is also to broaden our, our reach out to global customers. Uh, our technology partners include the usual suspects, Intel, Nvidia, Orange, etc., and we are featured in, in a series of uh, big publications and, and get award by these. Um, Finally, I invite you to come see me on the second floor at, at my booth if you want to learn more about lightweight and explainable AI. Thank you so much. All right, let's all give one more round of applause to all our incredible speakers today. I also want to remind you to be using the link on the back of your name badge to vote. We're gonna have one more chance to vote while we play our final video, and then we will announce the IoT People's Choice Award. So we'll go ahead and play this now, but please keep voting. This is the Plug and Play Smart Cities Conference, and I'm here to talk about some groundbreaking research that we endeavored on a couple years ago that look at the impacts to cities on, from digital payments. I'm here at Plug and Play to meet with the ecosystem of smart cities, smart city vendors, companies, all looking towards understanding how the city ecosystem is shaping in the future. I came in to speak a little bit more around prototypes for smart cities for the future. I think it's important to have government corporations and startups coming together. Smart cities are necessary because our planet's going to go from 7 billion to 9 billion people. The existing law enforcement apparatus is just not going to be able to scale. Something we've seen a little bit but attending today's session really cemented is the idea that the smart city is not about just dealing with a city. City is a community and any solution that really goes into a city has to be a community first solution. I think the biggest thing was 
this discourse is and how many different kinds of players are actually involved in the smart city space. As a startup in the ecosystem, one of the things that's very challenging is getting connected with the right corporates who can help us continue to grow and potentially even fund our growth as well. And Plug and Play has been instrumental at making the connections to the companies that we would like to meet with and would not have otherwise been able to speak with. You have a lot of people with a lot of ideas, but when they're disparate, it doesn't work. They need to come together and they need to come together efficiently and have a transparent forum and work together to hit their objectives. Okay, thank you guys. The time has come. We, I know we're sort of dispersing, but can we get a quick drum roll for the winner? People's Choice Award, IOT. <laughs> Welcome to the stage, OmniSpeech. Okay, and we do have networking upstairs on the second floor, so everyone can head up um, and enjoy the rest of the time together. Thank you, guys. <laughs>